Hi, and welcome to episode four of the Western Canon Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Alexander Hill, and today we'll be examining the themes and motifs of Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey. Hi, and welcome back to the Western Canon Podcast. Homer's Odyssey and its prequel, The Iliad, are the first works of literature in the Western world. The Odyssey is the story of Odysseus, the king of Ithaca, and his long and difficult journey to return home after the Trojan War. For a full summary of Homer's Odyssey, and in order to hear my interview with the classicist Daniel Mendelssohn, you should go back to episode three of this podcast. I do about a 50-minute summary of Homer's Odyssey that uh, is largely plot-based. Daniel and I also talk about fathers and sons, uh, Penelope's plight, Telemachus's predicament, and we also talk about Daniel's book, An Odyssey, A Father, A Son, and An Epic. Now this month, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Odyssey's influence on culture. I'd like to dive into a few of the important themes in the book. Also joining us on this month's show is the first woman to translate Homer's Odyssey into English, Emily Wilson. She'll be talking about her brand new translation uh, of the Odyssey, her theory of translation, and her life as a scholar, among other topics. We'll also have our Western canon correspondent, Gina Santiago, uh, on the show, who will be talking about Odysseus's famous wily intelligence, and she's going to introduce us to this concept of phronesis. So let's get started. It's fair to say that Homer's Odyssey has had a huge impact on Western art and culture, and this influence extends easily through the 20th century and into today. The very word Odyssey is basically now an English synonym for any long or hard journey. Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey, has inspired countless artists, writers, and filmmakers, and is in fact the inspiration for many films and uh, subsequent works of literature. I can mention a few big name projects and works of art, but to name all of the ways that Homer's Odyssey has affected the art and literary worlds, uh, and to name all of the ways that it has seeped into our culture uh, without us even knowing it would take months. But here are a few. James Joyce's 1922 novel, Ulysses, is actually a comparison to and something of a play on Homer's Odyssey. The name Ulysses is actually derived from the Latin name for Odysseus. Stephen Dedalus, uh, who is Joyce's literary alter ego and a main character in the book, has many comparisons to Telemachus. And Leopold Bloom, another main character, is often seen as the wandering Odysseus himself, uh, while Molly Bloom is thought of as a kind of Penelope, so the characters are mostly all there. And it isn't just the West uh, that has been influenced by the Odyssey. Um, some of the stories about Sinbad the Sailor in A Thousand and One Arabian Nights were lifted directly from Homer. Uh, the story of Sinbad's third voyage is clearly based on an episode from Homer's Odyssey, with the man-eating Cyclops uh, and, and the events of Sinbad's fourth voyage uh, this this draws on two separate events from Homer's Odyssey, including the scene with the Lotus Eaters and also the scene with the witch Circe. Another famous book that works off of the Odyssey is the 1997 novel Cold Mountain by Charles Fraser. Now, I've never read this book, but it's said to have been inspired by the Odyssey, and I guess it, it follows the plot of the Odyssey fairly closely um, as the main character struggles to return home after being wounded in the Civil War, um, and this would be in the American South. The book was turned into a movie uh, in 2003, and it starred Nicole Kidman, Jude Law, and Renee Zellweger. I did see the movie. Uh, it was terrible, uh, but I hear the book is good. Speaking of the silver screen, uh, the first film adaptation uh, of at least a part of uh, The Odyssey is Georges Méliès' uh, 1905 silent film, The Mysterious Island, Ulysses and the Giant Polyphemus. This is kind of a, a fun film to watch. Uh, it's, it's a very cute film. Um, it was an initial attempt to dramatize one of the great action scenes from, from, the, from the epic poem, uh, the scene when Odysseus blinds the Cyclops Polyphemus. It's actually a very funny film to watch. I will post the video on our website under the tab labeled links. Uh, the movie's short. It's just 
four minutes long. It's a short film. Um, and you'll see Odysseus dressed like a Spartan uh, for some reason. The plot's all wrong. It shows Odysseus basically just hanging out with these uh, lovely ladies on the beach. And then this Cyclops comes up and attacks, but it's just like a giant head sticking out of the mouth of a cave. Um, the head you can see, if you look closely, clearly has three eyes, uh, though the human pair of eyes is covered up with makeup, and there's a shoddy, um, gigantic, bulging, precariously constructed, twitchy eye plastered to the Cyclops' forehead. Um, and then Odysseus, you know, the brave Odysseus, uh, sneaks up to it and, and, and jumps out and stabs uh, stabs it in the eye with a spear. And all of this uh, pus comes out. It's very theatrical and ridiculous. So so this is kind of amazing. You should visit the website and check that out. There's also the famous 1954 film version of the story. It's called Ulysses, and that is featuring the great Kirk Douglas. Um, the film is directed by Mario Camerini, and here's the 1954 trailer of that. Pretty awesome stuff. Starring Kirk Douglas as the mightiest of warriors, mightiest of lovers. In this mightiest of motion pictures, Ulysses! Only a great star like Kirk Douglas could portray so great a hero. Thrill as Ulysses dares the hideous one-eyed Cyclops. Gasp at the black magic of Circe the Enchantress who turns Ulysses and his men into swine. Give me back my men, goddess, demon, witch, or whatever you are. Marvel at the tremendous spectacle of the Trojan War. Ulysses and his warriors springing from the mammoth wooden horse to overwhelm the walls of Troy. See Ulysses live his fantastic adventures again. Film where they actually happened 5,000 years ago. The thousand and one thrills of Ulysses. The greatest of all adventurers. Mightiest of all warriors. Biggest of all motion pictures. Ulysses! <laughs> that is, I think, the mightiest of all movie trailers. Ulysses! Ulysses! So that's amazing stuff. Now, one of my fa favorite film references to the Odyssey um, is a collection of movies are the famously innovative uh, stop-motion animation films of the artist Ray Harryhausen. Um, he was greatly inspired by the uh, themes, the action sequences, the exotic locales, and the uh, fangorious monsters featured in uh, Homer's Odyssey. In fact, his 1958 film, The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, his, his 1963 film, Jason and the Argonauts, and his 1981 film, uh, Clash of the Titans, these movies were all inspired uh, by uh, Odysseus's journey in the Odyssey, and they each featured lines and various elements of Homer's epic poem. And perhaps the best known uh, filmic reference to the Odyssey is Stanley Kubrick's classic sci-fi movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, Leonard Wheat, in his book Kubrick's 2001, A Triple Allegory, he argues that Kubrick's film is not just a heady statement, um, but a great big allegory, a surface story whose characters, events, and other elements symbolically tell a hidden story. In 2001's case, this is according to uh, Leonard Wheat, uh, while one of the three allegories happens to be Nietzsche's philosophical work, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, in the sense that, like Nietzsche's book, Kubrick's film describes man as a kind of rope dancer balanced between ape and ubermensch. Aside from that, it's an allegory about Homer's Odyssey. Um, this is obviously betrayed by the film's title. Wheat notes, uh, for example, that the name Bowman may refer to Odysseus, whose story ends with a demonstration of his prowess as an archer. If you remember from last episode, uh, we talked about this in detail. He also connects the one-eyed Hal with the Cyclops, interestingly enough, and notes that Bowman kills Hal by inserting a small key, just as Odysseus blinds the Cyclops with a stake. Wheat argues also that the entire film contains references to almost everything that happens to Odysseus on his travels, and he makes that argument in his book. Pretty neat stuff. Even The Simpsons found inspiration in Homer's epic poem. In the third episode of its first season on air, that would be 1990, the episode is called Homer's Odyssey. Uh, 
And in the 13th season of The Simpsons, we also get an episode called Tales from the Public Domain that directly satirizes the Odyssey and actually places Homer in the story, that, that would be Homer Simpson, in the story of the ancient Greek epic. Other filmic interpretations of the Odyssey uh, include the made-for-TV 1997 miniseries of Homer's work that starred Armin Asante and Isabella Rossellini. Um, I hear this version is, is okay. If you're really geeky about Homer, you might want to check it out. I saw 20 minutes of it and didn't really want to commit to the whole thing, but it seemed fine uh, for what it is. So you might want to check it out. You might also want to... Uh, to watch, if you haven't done so already, the Coen Brothers film from 2000, uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, great film that is is also loosely based on the Odyssey. In this movie, John Goodman is the Cyclops, uh, but he's just kind of a bad dude with a patch over his eye. We could also talk about the theater uh, making its way onto the theater scene. There was a 1954 Broadway musical called The Golden Apple, which was actually adapted from both the Iliad and the Odyssey. So the musical is set in Washington State, and the story relocates the, um, the Odyssey to the first decade of the 20th century. And again, the hero is not called Odysseus, but Ulysses. Um, and what the story does is it basically transplants uh, Homer's Odyssey to the little town of Angel's Roost, which is apparently nestled at the foot of uh, Mount Olympus, Washington's Mount Olympus. In the story, Ulysses has been fighting in the Spanish-American War, um, but he is on his way home to be reunited with his beloved Penelope. So they keep the names the same. Speaking of musicals and music, there is also a Steely Dan song, Home at Last, from the album Aya, which features an unnamed Odysseus as the narrator. And we could even mention the American metal band Symphony X. These guys made a 24-minute long musical version of Homer's poem, uh, and they too titled it The Odyssey. And here's a clip of it. So you get the picture. Good times there with Symphony X. At least someone is still reading the Western classics. Uh, now, beyond these novels and, uh, you know, Broadway performances and film and television, I mean, we could go on all day with these references. Uh, but I wanted to give listeners a sense of how culturally massive the Odyssey has been, how unbelievably central it is to our storytelling and to our mythic imagination in the West. I want to look next at one of the more famous poems. Um, this one is by Alfred Lord Tennyson, uh, published in 1842. It's called Ulysses. Uh, surprise, surprise. It is written in blank verse, um, that is, uh, unrhymed iambic pentameter, and uh, I'll read it for you here, and, and we'll talk a little bit about it. And again, this is Ulysses by Tennyson. It little profits that an idle king, by this still hearth among these barren crags, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race, that hoard and sleep and feed and know me not. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone, on shore, and when through scuttling drifts the rainy Hyades vexed the dim sea, I am become a name. For always roaming with a hungry heart, much have I seen and known, cities of men and manners, climates, councils, government, myself not least, but honored of them all, and drunk delight of battle with my peers far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am part of all that I have met. Yet all experience is an arc where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use, as though to breathe were life. Life piled on life were all too little, and of one to me little remains. But every hour is saved from that eternal silence, something more, a bringer of new things, and vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself, and this gray spirit yearning in desire 
to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. (laughs) This is my son, mine own Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter and the isle, well loved of me, discerning to fulfill this labor by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people, and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centered in the sphere of common duties, decent not to fail in offices of tenderness, and pay me to adoration to my household gods when I am gone. His works are his work, I mine. There lies the port, the vessel puffs her sail, there gloom the dark broad seas. My mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me, that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts, free foreheads. You and I are old. Old age hath yet his honor and his toil. Death closes all, but something ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks, the long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. So this wonderful poem is is about what it must be like for an adventurous hero to return home to the normal, bland, mundane, domestic life that has been waiting for him uh, while he was away all this time, away fighting battles, leading men into danger, sailing the wine-dark seas, conquering lands, bedding goddesses, and essentially boldly going where no man has gone before, and to use the Star Trek reference, defeating monstrous beasts in exotic lands and dining with kings and queens and magisterial palaces. In this poem, Odysseus, who is named Ulysses, but I'll call him Odysseus to be consistent, Odysseus is declaring a kind of existential angst, a general lack of contentment uh, being back at home on Ithaca, a kind of indifference to his to his bland domestic situation and his his duties as leader. To have seen all that he has seen, and then to be forced to stay home by this quote still hearth with his old wife. And here he is as king, doling out rewards and punishments for the unnamed masses, the, quote, savage race whom he governs. As he muses, he proclaims that he, quote, cannot rest from travel, but feels compelled to live to the fullest still and to swallow every last drop of life. He notes that his malaise is is partly a feature of his undying thirst for knowledge, that even as an old man, his, quote, gray spirit yearns in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. So for Odysseus, his despair is that of a man with a hungry mind who yearns to travel and learn about the world. His is the complex of the explorer, He even declares that his travels and encounters have shaped who he is. I am a part of all that I have met, he asserts. For Odysseus, here uh, in Tennyson's poem, it is boring or, quote, dull to stay in one place. To remain stationary is to, quote, rust rather than to shine. He then goes on to discuss and characterize his son Telemachus, 
uh, who would be his successor while the great hero resumes his travels. He says, quote, This is my son, mine own Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter and the isle. He seems to respect his son's capabilities as a ruler. He praises his dedication and his wisdom and his devotion to the gods. And yet in the poem, there seems to be a distance between them, or at least a sense that the two are cut of a different cloth. Uh, That while Telemachus is a uh, bureaucratic, diplomatic, um, thoughtful type, um, Odysseus is again a rugged, striving explorer. Uh, so of Telemachus, he says, quote, he works his work, I work mine. In the final stanza, Odysseus shares a bit of his life philosophy, uh, inspiring sentiments that, that one should make use of one's old age. He reveals that he's not naive about his mortality. He says, quote, death closes all. So he knows that death waits for no man. However, he declares that his goal is to sail onward beyond the sunset because, quote, something ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done. And moreover, quote, tis not too late to seek a newer world. So this is an interesting interpretation of Odysseus, although to what degree it It's accurately describing a man who threw away immortality to return desperately to his home. I think that is an open question. The poem does remind us of what it must be like, and I think this is confirmed ad nauseum in war literature, what it must be like for soldiers who fight overseas, soldiers, uh, our soldiers, who kill and raid and run towards enemy fire and Um, who develop an intense comradeship with their fighting units, who journey to diverse, strange, and sometimes exotic locations. Think about uh, Iraq, Vietnam, Japan, uh, Europe, and who must inevitably, after experiencing much trauma, who must return to their normal, tedious, monotonous lives and, you know, take some drab, buttoned-up, rote office job and be polite to everyone— How do you do that? Can you imagine asking a man to kill, right? Asking a man to run into gunfire, to jump out of a plane, to throw a grenade, right? At a group of people. And then to ask him to integrate seamlessly back into polite society and find a job. So Ulysses, like many of Tennyson's other poems, you might say deals with men's desire to reach beyond the limits of their ordinary, limited field of vision, uh, and to reach beyond the mundane details of everyday life, to journey for something more. Okay, so I want to now emphasize and linger on a theme of Homer's Odyssey that is not often discussed, and that is the theme of Xenia. The reason I think that this theme isn't discussed more is probably because, as a term, Xenia seems to lack an adequate definition. Uh, Xenia is one of the most important uh, themes in the Odyssey, and it means guest-host relationship. Um, Hospitality is also sometimes used as a translation. However, this is kind of a weak word to use for translating Xenia because it lacks that sense of absolute responsibility that Xenia has. It lacks the sense of hospitality as a duty, not as something that one chooses to honor or not to honor. So Xenia is a reciprocal relationship between two Xenoi. Uh, that's the plural of um, of Xenos. Uh, the singular is obviously Xenos, which can be translated as guest, host, stranger, foreigner, uh, and friend. Now, these words are all quite different, as you can see, so that can be confusing. The reason for this is because Xenia, the larger concept, is attempting to describe a relationship that you enter into in ancient Greek society. So take the example of a traveler in ancient Greece. The traveler would present himself at the door of a house that looks as though it's about his same social or class status. So if he's a poor beggar, he would go to the hut of another poor man. If he's a prince, he would go to a palace. And once he gets there, he would go to the door and say, basically, can you please take me in for the night? Uh, so if you think about it, uh, he's a Xenos in the sense that he's a guest. 
But he's also a Xenos from the host's perspective because he's a foreigner or stranger. Note that this is where the word xenophobia comes from. Now, once the once the stranger, once the man um, who goes to the door is is allowed in, once he is taken in, once he is given a meal, given a bed for the night, he becomes a quote friend. Um, though this is not the ordinary sense of affection or fondness that the word friend normally connotes. Uh, This version of the word friend has more to do with a bond that is formed between these two people um, that comes with certain obligations once, once they have entered into this relationship where the one helps the other. Um, This bond carries on and remains and and is actually hereditary. In fact, their children, the children of the guest and the children of the householder, if they ever met, would have obligations to one another. Um, Another fact of Zania is, and this is very important, is that the guest is also supposed to give a gift to his host. Um, And another thing is that it's it's very important, uh, according to the etiquette of Zania, Um, for a guest never to overstay their welcome. Now, thinking about this concept, um, Zania, such a concept, uh, such a tradition, uh, we don't have an equivalent one uh, in the the West today. And it can only work, uh, Zania, can only work if both participants in the relationship are motivated not to abuse the tradition. Uh, The guest must not rob, harm, mistreat, or take advantage of the host in any way. Um, So what this implies is that an etiquette and a set of general values and a sense of duty and obligations must be shared by the members um, of of a given society for a concept like Zania to work. For Zania to work in a society, there also has to be a set of sanctions against a person if they violate Zania. And in the Iliad and the Odyssey, we can actually see this come into play with the gods. Zania, for example, is overseen in the Homeric epics by Zeus himself. Zeus, Xenios, the god of Zania. So a guest who mistreats his host or a host who mistreats or turns away a guest, and yes, I did say turns away, you have to accept the guest. This is part of Zania. You have to take people into your home if they share your status. Um, A person who mistreats his guest or a person who mistreats his host um, has offended and violated the will of Zeus and will suffer for this. Um, You can see that this principle is huge um, in the Iliad. Think back to when Paris abducted Helen. Uh, This was perhaps the most extreme violation of Zania that has ever occurred in Western literature. You know, Paris is the guest of Menelaus. He was Menelaus's Zenos. He was, Paris was given food and drink and, and more than sufficient hospitality. And what does he do? He sleeps with, steals, and runs away with Menelaus's wife, Helen. So the Trojan War, this epic war, is actually, at the bottom of it, is a war fought over a violation of Xenia, okay? So Xenia is a key theme in the Iliad and in the Odyssey, and this just shows you how important Xenia is. In the Odyssey, the theme of Xenia is absolutely central. Xenia is is both destructive and at the same time vital to Odysseus's aims as he tries to return home. In the first four books of the Odyssey, uh, Xenia, for example, is the central theme, okay, even with Telemachus. In books one and two, for example, we see Telemachus dealing with Xenia from the host's perspective on Ithaca um, as he is dealing with the suitors who are trying to marry his mother and take over his household. Um, th- their wrongdoing, you'll notice, is almost entirely couched in a discussion of these suitors' violation of Xenia. Uh, in, in book two, if you remember, Telemachus um, calls an assembly and stresses this violation of Zania as he chastises the suitors. He says, quote, First, I lost my father, who was kind to you as if you were also his sons. Now, even worse, my house is being ripped apart. My wealth will soon be gone. The sons of all the nobles have shoved inside my house to court my mother against her wishes. They haunt our house day after day and kill our cows, our pigs, and good fat goats. They feast and drink red wine, not caring if they waste it all. There is no man to save the house. No man like him, Odysseus. 
and and remember this is this is Telemachus speaking to the to the horrible suitors um and and I'll continue quote I cannot fight against them I would be useless I have had no training but if I had the power I'd do it they ruined my whole house it isn't fair the angry gods will turn on you in rage they will be shocked at all of this criminal behavior but never mind friends leave me be and let me cry unquote after making this uh speech this i would say pathetic speech the bard writes that telemachus frustrated quote flung the scepter down and burst out crying so i want to reflect on two things here one i want to talk about this concept of xenia um which i think is is very important and i think it can also speak to or at least make more sophisticated um, the conversation that we tend to have about the ethics of hospitality um, about justice and what we owe our fellow citizens and even about immigration and perhaps um, the limits of openness for the greeks xenia is a sacred duty in fact it's more than that for the greeks it is a cornerstone a basis of civilization that we are our brother's keeper that in a society we must care for one another is a vital and humane ideal that many would argue is sorely lacking in our country and in the modern world on the other hand the idea that xenia is a relationship that comes with sacred and inviolable obligations for both parties I think is also key here in any political discussion of what it means to adopt certain norms of hospitality, welcoming folks into your home, your community, your society, your country. And although all societies, that is all sovereign states throughout history, although all sovereign states have retained the right to regulate who comes into their society, um this is the idea that state sovereignty, border control, migration restrictions are a sensible and universal norm of modern human life. Although this is the case, norms of hospitality and an acknowledgement of universal human dignity must be tied to this. In the Odyssey, we get a nuanced portrait of hospitality. On the one hand, you have the portrait of these barbaric suitors, these home invaders, bothering the women of the household, taking advantage of Telemachus's kindness, consuming all the household's resources while not chipping in or contributing to their replenishment. Uh, you know, they're stealing Odysseus's goods, they're engaging in, quote, criminal behavior, and they're in violation of their own obligation as guests, um, formerly they had been guests, um, of this benevolent household. Now I'm going to play a clip by the classics professor Elizabeth Vandiver. Here she discusses both Telemachus's chastisement of the suitors for their violation of Xenia, and she also expounds on the suitors' response to this chastisement, which I think really demonstrates the failure of the suitors, uh, the guests here, to live up to Xenia, making hospitality really impossible. Telemachus, as I already mentioned, denounces the suitors for destroying his goods without ever giving anything in return. And he's backed up in this denunciation of the suitors by a prophet, an old man, a seer, a reader of omens, Halitherses, who predicts misfortune for the suitors if they do not mend their ways. Halitherses sees an omen, a flight of birds in the sky, and as very frequently in the Iliad and the Odyssey both, birds flying by are omens that specially trained or specially gifted seers and prophets can interpret. In this omen, Halitherses sees two eagles fly by that Zeus sends. They fly by and overhead and tear one another with their talons. Halitherses interprets this omen to mean that Odysseus is going to return home soon and that there will be terrible repercussions for the suitors if they do not change their behavior before Odysseus comes home. Now, the response of the suitors to Halitherses' prophecy is, I think, absolutely essential for our understanding both of the suitors' character and of how we're supposed to view these suitors in the Odyssey. One of the suitors, their spokesman, Eurymachus, responds to Halitherses after Halitherses has said that Odysseus is about to come home and the suitors must 
change their ways or suffer the consequences. Eurymachus, answering Halitherses, says, Old man, better go home and prophesy to your children, for fear they may suffer some evil to come. In these things I can give a much better interpretation than you can. Many are the birds who wander under the sun's rays. Not all of them mean anything. Odysseus is dead, far away, and how I wish that you had died with him also. Then you would not be announcing all these predictions, nor you, would you so stir up Telemachus, who is now angry. And Eurymachus continues his speech, it's a fairly long speech, by saying, if you keep doing this, Halitherses, if you keep stirring up Telemachus, we'll lay a penalty on you that will make you very sorry, and that Telemachus must tell Penelope, choose a husband and marry now, we're not going to go away until she does, because, he, he concludes, in any case we fear no one, and surely not Telemachus, for all he is so eloquent, nor do we care for any prophecy which you, old sir, may tell us, which will not happen, and will make you even more hated, and his, that is Telemachus's, possessions will wretchedly be eaten away, there will not be compensation ever, while she, Penelope, makes the Achaeans put off marriage with her. Now, what Eurymachus has done in this speech is really rather stunning. In one fell swoop, he has shown disrespect for, disregard for, contempt for, just about every important element of the mores of his society. He's shown disrespect to an old man to begin with, and this is a society in which the old are definitely respected. He has shown disrespect to a prophet, which by implication means disrespecting the god whom that prophet serves, in this case, Zeus. He has said Odysseus is dead and made it quite clear that he's glad Odysseus is dead. This is showing disrespect to his rightful king. And if Odysseus is dead, in that case, who is Eurymachus' rightful king? Well, Telemachus. And what does Eurymachus say about Telemachus? Nothing good, I'm afraid. He goes on to say, I don't, we don't care about prophecies, which in effect means we don't care about the gods. We're going to force Penelope to marry whether she likes it or not. Everything that ought to be respected in this society, the old prophecy, the gods, the king, the rights of the king, the rights of the king's son, all of those in one speech Eurymachus simply spits on. So in the suitor's response here, you can see that to a large degree, Xenia depends on, the, on not only the host, um, but on the guests, uh, both fulfilling their end of the bargain, um, but also respecting and adopting, assimilating, if you will, uh, to the mores and norms, uh, the norms of civility uh, and the values dictated by the host society. So these men, as they corrupt the culture of Ithaca and as they seek to destroy the established norms, uh, they even plot to kill Telemachus, um, all of this behavior eventually leads to to their wholesale slaughter at the hands of Odysseus. Um, Odysseus here is perfectly uh, conforming to the Jungian archetype. He returns literally from the underworld in the land of chaos to save and renew his culture. The hero single-handedly slays all of the suitors. Um, now, on its face, this tale seems almost allegorical. It seems to serve almost as a warning of the dangers of kindness, uh, of the dangers of being meek and open-hearted, um, of the dangers of hospitality, uh, to the dangers of, say, accepting and opening your doors to strangers who may turn out to be dangerous. And yet I think this would be a careless interpretation. The Odyssey is a nuanced tale. For example, in Book 2, um, it's as if we're being given a, a lesson in the proper way to to honor Xenia. When the disguised Athena comes to the door of Odysseus's palace, where Telemachus lives, uh, Telemachus goes to the door, greets his guest. Remember, he doesn't know that the man at the door is Athena in disguise. He takes his guest by the hand, says, welcome Xenos, takes his spear away from him. By the way, this is in one way a kind of gesture of taking the burdens off of one's guests, like taking a guest's coat, um, but it's also a temporary security measure. Um, the guest, of course, can have his weapon back when it's clear to the host um, that the guest is friendly and does indeed observe the norms of Xenia. Uh, and Telemachus then takes his guest into the palace, um, this would be Athena in disguise, offers him food, a bath, and a bed for the night. Now, according to the rules of Xenia, and this is a crucial element of Xenia, 
It's only after the immediate physical needs have been met, this includes a meal, certainly, uh, and perhaps a rest, it's only after this that the host can ask the guest, according to the rules, who are you? Now, why would this be the case? Well, the most likely reason for this detail is that, remember, Zania is a relationship. The relationship of Zania, the practice of Zania, is not supposed to depend on whether the host likes the guest whether the host has some prejudgment about the guest based on who they are, etc. No, Zania is supposed to be a matter of helping a stranger, regardless of the circumstances. It's a kind of duty-based community norm, a brotherly hospitality that is practiced regardless of who the person is. And Telemachus, we see, fulfills all of the obligations of Zania. He is a hospitable host. He is a well-mannered gentleman, and he is a good man. So this too reflects on Odysseus and the values of his family and his home. So even though Odysseus will at the end come home to slaughter the suitors in a brutal way, we understand that this is because these suitors, in addition to being vile criminals and greedy usurpers, these suitors are dishonoring and failing to heed one of the core values that undergirds his civilization, that being Xenia. In the suitor's violation of Xenia, And in Telemachus' hospitality towards his guest and his honoring of Zania, it's as if Homer is giving us a lesson to say, this is how it's done. Moreover, in books three and four, we see Telemachus experiencing Zania from the guest's point of view. As his father's comrades in arms, Nestor and Menelaus, take him into their houses. Here again, we get to see Zania done the right way. Right. Nestor and Menelaus both treat Telemachus as a guest should be treated. Nestor even gives Telemachus a horse and a carriage, as well as a, a traveling companion, so that Telemachus can make it safely to Sparta. And Menelaus talks about all the wonderful gifts that Telemachus will receive once he leaves um, his palace. Menelaus's wife, Helen, even gives Telemachus, when he's weeping, a drug called Nepenthe, which means no pain or no grief, to ease uh, Telemachus's sorrows. Uh, to add to all of this, Zania turns out to be not only the vehicle for Telemachus's journey to find his father, but it's also the mechanism by which Odysseus is able to make it home. Odysseus turns out to be that rare hero who doesn't achieve his heroism by himself, but who is helped along the way by strangers and hosts. On his return, Odysseus receives hospitality from many people, uh, from King Alcinous, his wife Arete, their daughter Nausicaa, and the other Phaeacians, as well as from his loyal swineherd Eumaeus on his return back to Ithaca. Eumaeus, not knowing that the stranger is Odysseus, says, quote, Come inside, and when you have had your fill of bread and wine, tell me where you come from, and all about your misfortunes. He then says, quote, It is not for any such reason, uh, in return for good news, that I shall treat you kindly, but only out of respect for the God of hospitality, fearing him and pitying you. So it turns out that in the end, hospitality in the Odyssey wins the day. And yet there is a condition in all of this. And that condition has to do with the fact that Zania is a two-way street. Hospitality, then, is is a mark of a civilized person who engages in the arrangement of Zania with other civilized persons who respect these norms, which means that Zania is, is not absolute. It depends on the host as much as on the guest. As a civilized person, the wandering Odysseus, who visits many strange lands on his journey, seems to be continuously aware that the Zania he will or won't receive does depend to a large degree on the values of each land and the society he is entering. For example, after a rough sea voyage, Odysseus is wrecked on the Scorpion coast, where he says, and this is in book six, he says, quote, Alas, what kind of people have I come amongst? Are they cruel, savage, and uncivilized, or hospitable and humane? Judging by Odysseus' words, Xenia seems to be an arrangement made among people who share a set of religious values and a common understanding of important norms of decency, respect, and civility. This connection between the expectation of hospitality with a sense of shared civilized values 
is made clear as Odysseus describes his encounter with what he calls the lawless, outrageous Cyclops. Uh, This is the Cyclops Polyphemus who ends up killing and eating six of Odysseus's men. As Odysseus and his men are preparing to scope out this wooded island, Odysseus actually says to his men, quote, wait here while I go and find out about these people and learn what they are, whether they are savage and violent and without justice or hospitable to strangers and with minds that are godly. He eventually concludes with the diagnosis that the Cyclopes, and that's plural for Cyclops, quote, neither plow with their hands nor plant anything. All grows for them without seed planting, without cultivation. It is Zeus's rain that waters it for them, unquote. The moral of the story, as Zania plays out, I think is aptly stated by Odysseus after he returns to Ithaca. While he is savagely killing the suitors, those violators of Zania, he explains to the houseboy Medon that his merciless behavior is kind of a lesson. This is in book 22. Medon says that Odysseus is perhaps, quote, too strong and furious against the suitors, to which Odysseus responds that he hopes his actions, he says to Medon, will show that, quote, doing good is far superior to wickedness. And this quote is from the Emily Wilson translation. So the question is, what does Odysseus mean by good here? Well, we might say that above all, to do good means to observe Zania, not only as a host, but as a guest. So taking a step back, we have to ask ourselves, how do we as people perform as hosts? Do we welcome people into our homes? Do we help family members and community members when they are in need? Are we kind to strangers? How does contemporary America, along with other democracies of the West, how do we measure up by the ethical standards of the Odyssey? Do we observe Zania? How do we as potential hosts treat our suppliants and travelers? Are we, quote, cruel, savage, and uncivilized? Or are we actually quite hospitable and humane to those individuals of goodwill who share our values and respect our norms and traditions? We then have to ask, How do our guests measure up? Do they share our values? Do they reciprocate in the process of Zania? Okay, so now I'd like to introduce this month's special guest, Professor Emily Wilson. Dr. Wilson is a British classicist. We're very proud to have her on the show. She is professor of classics at the University of Pennsylvania. She received her PhD from Yale and her master's and undergraduate degrees from Oxford College. She is the author of numerous books and publications. Uh, She also uh, just so happens to be the daughter of the literary historian A.N. Wilson. He too is a great writer. And Dr. Wilson has the honor, as I mentioned, of being the first woman ever to translate Homer's Odyssey into English. So let's get her on. Hi, Dr. Wilson. Thank you for joining the program. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So before we get into the Odyssey, I want to start by asking you a sort of a two-part question about your scholarly background. Where did you get your training? Where did you receive your training? And what is your approach uh, to to classical scholarship? And then the second uh, part, I'm always interested to know... uh, you know, how my guests fell in love with the classics. Um, I know that you come from a family of academics. I read about that in the New York Times profile of you. Um, what was it that drew you to the classics? Um, what was it that inspired you to pursue a career as a professor and, and as a translator? Was it something that you fell into? Was it something that you felt like you're, you know, you've, you've always been bred for this coming from an academic family? Was it something that you always wanted to do? <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I, I grew up in England, as you can hear, I grew up in Oxford. And when I was eight years old, my elementary school did a production of the Odyssey. I mean, obviously a, a kid's version of the Odyssey. And I got to play the goddess Athena. And it was an absolutely wonderful experience for me. Um, I, I felt like I was a shy, geeky kind of kid. And it, being involved in this production made me so, sort of come out of my shell. But it also made me realize how important this this story and stories in general could be to me. Um, and, and I realized this is a story that's about um, about wanting to be home, but also about being lost and about this sort of fascinating relationship between Athena and Odysseus. Um, so it, it inspired me to want to 
to read more Greek myth and you know I read the kids versions of Greek myth and then when I got older I read you know more classics in translation I started studying Latin in high school and then Greek in high school um, and then I read classics and at Oxford which is a course that involves a lot of philosophy as well as literature and history um, and then I also did an MPhil in English literature at Oxford um, which was partly because I'm sort of fascinating co continuously by the relationship of classical literature, classical philosophy, classical history to later periods. And I wanted to try and figure out more about how how people in the in the early modern period were responding in literary, poetic and cultural ways to the classics. And um, and then I also just I, I have this deep love of poetry, both not just Greek and Latin poetry, but also English poetry. And I think you can sort of see in my Odyssey translation that it's the translation of somebody who's read a lot of iambic pentameter, and I couldn't have done that, pulling up, pulling off writing an iambic pentameter for the whole of the the Odyssey if I hadn't read a lot of it already. So then after Oxford, I went to Yale for my PhD, and I did a PhD in classics and complete because I was uh, I was still and you know, remain interested in the reception of classics as well as reading the original uh, Greek and Roman literature. Um, I feel like I've lost track of, of at least three other elements in your question. Um, <laughs> so, yes. so maybe I'll ask you, um, why did you choose iambic pentameter? Besides the fact that you were, were familiar with it, what what made you feel confident enough to make the choice to say, I'm going to do this in iambic pentameter? Well, so one reason that I did the project in the first place was that I'm, I, I was frustrated by the fact that so many of the translations that people read, commonly of the Odyssey and English, um, don't have a regular meter. And the original has such a beautiful and regular metrical music. And it seemed to me that's a, a, an essential part of what the experience of reading the original poem is all about. It's about hearing something and being able to read something out loud, which goes along in the same uh, um, dactylic hexameter every single line, even though, of course, of course, there are also variations in the pace, but it's a flexible enough kind of meter that it's both always the same and always different. So I chose a meter which is different from the original meter, but which has a long history of being used in English. And obviously in archaic Greece, dactylic hexameter was the normal meter. If you want to write a narrative poem or if you want to um, tell a story, if you're an archaic Greek bard, you use dactylic hexameter. If you're an English poet, um, the, I think the equivalent is iambic pentameter. It's the it's the meter of Shakespeare. It's the meter of meter of Chaucer. I mean, I wanted to bring out the ways that Homer is a that Homeric poems are poems which have their own um, long tradition behind them, and they should be both very metrical and also very speakable, and have have a kind of um, a range and a fluidity and a should be should be both sometimes almost ordinary, but then then have these moments of majesty and magic as well. And I felt like if I try and do a super fancy kind of meter which doesn't fit English, like if I tried to write a dactylic hexameter in English, which I think has never actually successfully been done for more than two lines, um, I didn't feel like it would sound as as deeply much like English verse as I wanted it to. So iambic pentameter fits English better and dactylic hexameter yeah. fits Greek better. I guess that makes yes. that makes sense. That makes a lot yeah. of sense to me. Um, so I wanted to, to, to next read a short passage from a recent New York Times profile. Uh, this is actually how I found out about you, and I, was, I got so excited. I said, I wonder if she'll come on the show. And um, you, were, <laughs> you were discussing your upbringing, and I thought maybe you, maybe you could expound upon this topic because I'm, I'm always interested in how how people got into to the classics and people's sort of uh, intellectual genealogies. And, and I'll, I'll give you a quote here from the profile. Mostly Wilson, and this is a quote here, mostly Wilson recall, recalls a quiet, almost somber childhood with her younger sister, the writer B. Wilson, and her father, the prolific biographer, novelist, and critic A. N. Wilson. I actually have one of his books, uh, The Victorians. There there was, quote, a lot of silence, Wilson says. As a kid, I was just aware of unhappiness and aware of these things that weren't ever being articulated, but the sense that nobody's going to be saying what they feel or encouraging anyone else to say what they feel. If you're unhappy, all you can do is go to your room and cry silently. And so the reason I'm bringing this up uh, 
is because this is really the opposite of my childhood. Um, I grew up in a very noisy, chaotic, yeah. you know, working class household. Everyone's very emotional and constantly chatting, and there's dogs barking and cats running around, and and um, and it was it was it was Dickensian in a way. It reminds it, it remind. I read uh, David Copperfield a couple years ago, and it reminds me of uh, of the uh, Pegades, the Pegades. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like I'm a lone, lone creature, Daniel. <laughs> it's like that's 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 my mom. But so, so um, so so my background wasn't necessarily conducive to scholarly pursuits or rigor or close reading texts in a quiet room. So I wonder, I found myself reading your description of your upbringing and thinking, gosh, that might have been okay for me. Like, like the, the quiet and the seriousness and, and um, so my passion for scholarship and, and bookish pursuits came later on. Um, and I think they would have come a lot earlier on uh, had my upbringing been different. So was there a strong sense early on in your household that this is, this is just what you do? You become a scholar. Was it, so was it destined? Was it predestined? Uh, that you were going to, that you were going to do this. Were you were you taught Latin and Greek at a young age? In other words, did your upbringing make it easy for you to to swiftly enter this world of of academia and seriousness and and the competitive publishing and all of that? Uh, those are those are several very different things. I mean, I think you don't actually envy a miserable, silenced kind of childhood. Nobody would envy that. It was, you know, and I don't think it was destiny either. I mean, I, I, when I was a kid, I thought I wanted to be a doctor and save the, save people, you know, save people's lives. Um, I mean, I knew I loved reading, but I also treated reading as a kind of escape. And I and I certainly took a very long time to figure out that I, in fact, I was able to to speak and interact with people in the way that you absolutely need to in order to be a good teacher. And that it, it took me a long time to develop those skills. And I think my childhood in many ways inhibited the development of those skills. Um, so no, I don't think it was destiny. And I don't know that you should envy me. I mean, I think and not that I should wallow in self pity either, but I just think it's choices are so complicated, right? I mean, what people learn both from books and from their own lives, you can't actually trace a dotted line of because this, then that. I mean, I think you can you can you can always tell several different stories. I mean, the thing that that I bring out also in that New York Times piece about how um, I was hungry for something different, and I liked the um, emotional rawness of Greek tragedy and Latin epic when I read read them in high school, and I I continued to to love that about the classics. That even if I wasn't screaming, I could be reading about people who were, and I loved that. I needed to scream. Wow. Wow, that's great. So switching gears, I want to get into the Odyssey now with you. Um, I want to talk about your translation and, and your approach as a translator. And then I'd like to actually talk about some of the, the characters and themes in the Odyssey. Um, I was speaking to Daniel Mendelssohn last month, and he was saying something like, there are two types of people in the world, Iliad people and, and Odyssey people. I'm more of an Odyssey person. I like the adventure and the close-up, intimate look at the characters and, and the... And the it, in, in many ways, the Odyssey seems to me to be a kind of meditation on storytelling um, itself. Yeah. Um, the father-son thing, the, the husband and wife thing, and, and in many ways, it's about relationships. Why the Odyssey for you, Dr. Wilson? Um, I mean, because I, I don't know how you feel about this, but undertaking a translation of the Odyssey just seems to me to be such a daunting, um, you know, epic epic itself and risky task. I imagine long, arduous hours, days, months, years of just toiling over Greek and not knowing how the world would receive your translation, your in, your interpretation. So what is it about the Odyssey? Why why did you choose to do this? And and then maybe tell me what's so great about the Odyssey? Like what drew you to it? Um, you must be an Odyssey person. Why? <laughs> you know, I'm, for many, many years, I thought I was an Iliad person. And I, I actually think you don't have to choose. I think there's, a, there's, in some ways, they have a lot in common. You know, I mean, they both have this, this focus on the individual and the community and what happens when a, when a man is separated from, from his community. I mean, in fact, I read the final reconciliation between Odysseus and Penelope as in, in many, many ways a mirror image of the scene at the end of the Iliad where Priam and Achilles um, meet and they, they both have this enormous pain and Priam's pain is caused by Achilles mm. and Penelope's pain is caused by Odysseus mm. and they have a moment of meeting through pain. So I, I, mean, I, I don't actually think you have to choose. I think you can have a deep love of both. I mean, I realize that I... 
I love the Odyssey much more now than I used to. Um, I used to think this whole, um, I used to have, I, I think, a simpler idea about how much, how, how much it's about a, a father and a son and a heteronormative patriarchal marriage. And th those were things that turned me off. And I think I realize now more deeply than I used to that it, it has so much more in it than that. That it's so much focused on this wide range of different kinds of relationships, wide range of different kinds of people, um, and the the whole both geographical and mythic and temporal and psychological breadth of it is uh, enormously fascinating to me. I mean, I, I love it both in the way that sort of my eight-year-old self sort of loved it already for this reason of be, that it's a poem about. Um, about being lost and trying to find your way home and it's also a poem about identity and it's it's in a way we have these two models whereby Odysseus is constantly insisting that by by holding out in disguise or in absence or pretending he's somebody else he can eventually become exactly the same person that he always was mm. right he can become again the person he was 20 years ago and that in fact time doesn't matter place doesn't matter you can always be you and that's, I think, a sort of fascinating idea and a temptation. And then Penelope, I think, has a very different perspective, which is which, where she's constantly suggesting my bed and my face are marked by, by time and by pain. And in fact, there may be circumstances in which you don't get to choose what you want. You don't necessarily get to choose even who you marry, let alone anything else. She's totally stuck hmm. and it's not her fault. So I think that, that the poem is sort of presenting us with all these multiple different ways of being human and ways that humans can have their lives either either changed by circumstances or, or place or relationships or can try to shape the world to fit them in different ways. And then just the whole focus on how do you deal with people who aren't you? How do you deal with people who are not who are totally different from yourself, which obviously in fact is everybody in the whole world. Mm. But it's, it's sort of focused on these encounters between Odysseus and all these people who are not him and how, do, how can he deal with that? Encounters with otherness have, or something like that. Encounters with otherness. And that he, he, I think that the the second half of the poem tends to get much less attention than the first half. And the first half has all the wonderful magical wanderings, um, but the whole sequence of recognitions whereby Odysseus has to come home not just by setting foot on Ithaca. That's the geographical coming home, but it also has to be through forging and reforging all these different relationships that he has to come home in a different way to his old slave woman, old slave man, wife, son, Mother. dog father mother well mother's earlier but uh, and and it's not exactly a recognition scene but yeah in each case it is a different relationship which involves a different odysseus mm. and just this whole question of what it is to be a person and can you can you be multiple and still be one which i, I find really interesting and also the whole question in, which i think is wrapped up with odysseus's characterization of why do people want both to be visible and to be invisible you know, that he spends those seven years on the island of Calypso in hiding. And the poem implies that at least for some of those years, he's chosen to be in hiding. And then by the time we see him at the start of book five, he wants to come out of hiding and he wants to be seen. And the only place he can be seen is in Ithaca. So I think there's, there's this fluctuation that goes on th throughout the characterization of, of Odysseus, where he's both revealing and hiding himself. I, mean, I feel like that's, that's something which maybe all of us can relate to that we want both to show who we are and keep on saying our names, but then also say I'm somebody else and mm. not me. So on, on Ogigia, is, is, is Odysseus hiding from his family? Is he hiding from, is he hiding from the world? Is he hiding from himself? What's your interpretation? I think he's hiding from himself more. I, mean, I think he's, he's being hidden. He's, he's, um, He's living a, a sort of anti-epic poem kind of existence, right? I mean, that Calypso promises him that he can be immortal with her, like a god. But at the cost of that is that he has no story. Um, and he has no position of patriarchal male power in the house. Um, so that the whole sort of paying up, paying, payoff between, do you want to have a story, which will mean that eventually your story will end and you'll die? Or do you want to be sort of frozen in this eternal moment of where, where nobody can see you but you're there forever it reminds me a little bit of achilles the it, when you said the anti-epic hero achilles just sort of sitting it out um and, and again but i think that connection really is is there much more than some people recognize because it's so easy to make a contrast between the iliad is a poem about death the odyssey is a poem about survival which is true 
and the the Odyssey is, is about a journey home, and the Iliad is about a journey towards um, a community on the battlefield and towards letting go of anger. But it's a very different kind of journey. Mm. But there are also all these ways that the choice of Achilles and the choice of Odysseus they're not that different. There's a, there's the frozen hero at the start who's um, sitting it out and he's willing to to trade honor and having a story for having a longer life. Mm. And that, that choice is there for both of them. Mm. So uh, you mentioned the male-dominated uh, patriarchal world. Um, and I, I do want to talk about gender. I don't want to ignore uh, the gender thing. Um, being the first woman ever to translate Homer's Odyssey into English, first of all, I, I do want to ask why it's taken so long. I mean, aside from the, the male-dominated academia since the very beginning of academia, you know, they, I, I was actually surprised that no women had yeah, was, attempted. Yes. Uh, you know, there are there are 60 tr- translations of the Odyssey. I was really surprised that no women had attempted to translate this poem. In fact, I was speaking with a couple of, of, of friends about you, and, and they said, really? No way. Not in the 70s, not in the 80s, the 90s? No, no one has... No women have taken up the Odyssey, and and if and so that's that's one side of things that I want to ask you. And then there's another um, less politically correct question that I, I genuinely feel like I need to ask you. Um, I'm, I'm very curious about. I mean, I thought your translation was brilliant and edgy and very logical. And is there such a thing as a female translation of a work of literature like Homer's Odyssey? So. Mm-hmm. Will readers read your translation of the Odyssey in a different way because they know that it was translated by a woman? Are they right to? Uh, mm-hmm. Or is this sort of the problem? Is this, is this actually problematic? Um, could this be used against women in an unfair mm-hmm. way? So the first question is, why has it taken so long? And the second question is, are we? is there a gendered reading of, is there a way to, is, is your translation affected by, by your gender? Mm-hmm. Right. So I think the, I was shocked when I realized, I mean, I, so it was only after Norton if, if asked me to do the translation that I, that I found out that I was going to be the first woman to translate it. I was shocked to realize wow. that, that was true. I mean, 2017 or, you know, five years ago, 2012, still didn't happen. And, you know, f- 300 years ago, there was a French prose um, translation by a woman. There have been plenty of translations by women into other languages, so English is the problem. Um, there's also, it's also the case that, I mean, of course, there are many, many, many female classicists. So there, are, there are many women who've read, studied, ri- written about, um, Written about Homer. It's not like I'm the only, you know, female Homerist. But that, I think that thing maybe to get to the question of why has a woman not done a translation before, we have to get both to. Um, obviously, it couldn't have happened, or it was very unlikely to happen before about the 20th century. Even though there were it was a tiny handful of elite, learned women classicists before that, it, the numbers were very, very small. But so even in the 20th century, when there've been tons and tons of of women who had very, very deep knowledge of Greek, knowledge of the Homeric poems, why didn't they do a translation? I think there's like a couple of reasons. One is that um, women do get tenure at lower rates than women. So if you're going to invest the time in doing a project, you need to make sure that it's something which isn't going to damage your career. But, but translation isn't something which will get you tenure. It, it will, it's something that will take enormous amounts of time and will, in a way, potentially be a black mark really really can i pause you for a second there so (laughs) you do a translation of a of a classic work of literature which is an which is this long arduous just unbelievably intellectually rigorous project and that doesn't help you work towards tenure but i imagine what are you supposed to publish a bunch of articles and journals that no one ever reads and that gets you tenure it's supposed to do the, do the right kind of scholarly monographs, yes. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's not like, yeah, I, I, the, the, it's not, a, I don't want to be sort of saying that all of my colleagues don't get it, because I think many of my colleagues very much do get it and embrace the whole process of, of translation and recognize the value of it. But I think the whole structure of how, um, of how tenure assessment happens is, is very much skewed towards the scholarly monograph, the peer-reviewed scholarly monograph. And it's not at all skewed towards other kinds of writing. Other kinds of writing, you can do them on the side, but they're not actually going to get you up the career ladder. Um, so, I mean, I think given all that, and also then I guess the, the third thing to mention is that, of course, women usually have 
I mean, on average, more they have to spend more time in their week doing childcare, elder care, domestic labour. Mm -hmm. That's still true in 2017. So I think given all, all like, that cluster of things, both that translation is sometimes valued, but not exactly in the career ladder way, and then women are also going to struggle in different ways within academia, I think it gets you to some of the reason. I mean, I think it's also just relevant to notice that um, if you think about it, a wonderful woman translator like Sarah Rudin, she doesn't um, she doesn't have like a tenured professorship. You know, she does it. She just does translation. So the the whole thing of just being a woman who both has the um, the scholarly skills to do it, but then also whatever support to be able to do it financially. And then I think I guess maybe a, like a third, I can't remember how many points I've made right now, but the, um, I think a, another layer of this is just about um, it's a small set of people who are interested in doing translation anyway. I mean, there are plenty of sc classical scholars who aren't as interested in it because it's, I mean, in a way it's a creative writing project as much as it's I was going to say that. So I think like, that already cuts the possible pool of people down. And then, if you've already if you've cut cut the pool way down, and then there are already extra ways to cut down the pool of the female possible translators of the Odyssey, then I think you can sort of see why the dice are more against it than you might initially think. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I still find it shocking and, and astonishing. And you know, I hope that you know, in fifty years' time, we won't be still sort of saying, "But has no woman done this, that, or the other translation?" But maybe we will. I don't know. I agree. And, and I heard a statistic recently, and I, I don't know if it's true, um, but I heard that 80% um, of humanity's papers are never cited once. And yet, if you, mm -hmm. no matter who you are, if you produce a translation, a quality translation of the, of the Odyssey, it's going to be read hundreds of thousands of times yes. at least. I mean, you're you're yes. not, you're in the history books. You're on the list, you know. So, so. <laughs> I think I think it's also. I, I, then also, it doesn't just affect how students, general readers approach the Odyssey. It also, in fact, affects how people who've read the poem in Greek read it. I mean, translations actually have an impact on the history of interpretation afterwards. I mean, maybe this can get us to the gender question, which was the second part of your question mm -hmm. before. Um, I mean, I guess part of my answer is, I think we should talk about Robert Fagel's and Richmond Lattimore and Stanley Lombardo's gender too. I mean, we should talk about those translations right. as white male American translations. And I think that if we can admit that gender should gender is not a not a sort of neutral thing, the whole person, which might include gender, um, it affects your work. However, I mean, so I think there's a sort of there's a danger of people making the assumption that if your gender or your personal history or your particular interests affect your work, that means you're somehow biased or not effective or not uh, not objective and I think that's the whole mistake I mean I think you can be very very scholarly very very responsible trying to be as truthful as you possibly can be to every element that you can that you can see and pick out and hear and read in the original and then even given all that two people from two different demographic backgrounds and with two different personalities and two different sets of literary ears poetic senses all that are going to produce something very, very different. So I, I think given that that's the case, then of course gender is one of the things that's going to impact it. I mean, I think it's it's notable to me that, you know, there are these, there are obvious scenes that, that one can pick out um, about the way that there has been some, some real gender blindness in the way people have translated the Odyssey. And, you know, because of course being male is the unmarked gender category. Like men very often think, I don't need to think about gender because I have the right gender. Right, but right. So I mean, to think... I actually do need to think about gender because it's a problem for me. It's not a problem for men. Right. So I think it's the strength of, of my capacity to to read, interpret, and translate Homer that I'm I'm aware of gender. I'm thinking about it, and it, obviously it's a poem which is very much interested in gender roles and in gender inequality, gender hierarchies, um, gender relationships. So I think it's it's an advantage that I'm I'm not switched off on that part of um, the reading experience. I'm thinking about it critically. Right. So nobody, I mean, I'm sure nobody has asked Robert Fagels ever if his male bias in, influences no. his interpretation <laughs> of, of, then, uh, of the I'm Odyssey. Not, the late lamented Fagels, he's, he's, yes, it's too late to ask him that. But <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, in a way, it's, it's sad, but it's, it's revealing that it's just sort of assumed that, of course, of course, he's a man because that's the, that's the normal way to be. So, I mean, I, I just, 
so one of the, one of the classic cases that that I've talked about before is the case where um, where Telemachus insists on hanging the slave women, who in most other translations are not called slave women; they're called the disobedient serving maids. Which right. Again, it's, it's a whole other set of not necessarily gendered, but it's a whole other set of social biases. Um, because of course in the Greek it's clear that they're slaves. And then in, for instance, the Robert Fagel's version, he makes Telemachus say, you sluts, the suitors whores. And the Greek doesn't have any abuse in the language. It has, it says, I need to hang those who were sleeping with the suitors. So that was his, that was, he injected that into the text. That's his gender. I mean, that, that's his particular um, gender. You know, he, he's not thinking about it. I don't think he deliberately decided I'm going to do a misogynistic translation of the Odyssey, you know? But, of course, there is an element of that. Um, I mean, I think it plays out even in less shocking scenes. You know, I, I just was looking at, um, at the way that different translators translate the, the scene that we were just talking about, where Odysseus is with Calypso and he wants to leave. Um, and in other translations that I've looked at, it's very much skewed, much more than the original is, towards the perspective of Odysseus. Mm -hmm. And Calypso is described as... An I noticed that about your translation. Yeah. And... I don't, I don't think that the connotations of nymph, for instance, in English, are very sort of othering and distancing, and you can't actually have respect for somebody who's a nymph, right? <laughs> you, it, that's going to be somebody who's floating around in a see-through dress and not actually, you know, a real person. And the the whole depiction of female sexual desire in that scene, um, I don't think the Greek is mocking her, but I think most of the translations of that scene are mocking her. They're presenting her as this absurd figure who's about to be dumped. And... I actually don't think that the original is doing that. I think it's showing us the pain on both sides. So, so I, I think just being willing to, to, to suspend some kind of judgment and figure out whether, whether each of the characters in this text are more, more fully alive, I think that's actually a good thing. It's not, not, it, it sort of can be presented as she's biased, she's interpreting something. But I think I'm, in a way, trying to get deeper under the, the skin of the original. So given that Homer was obviously Homer existed in a patriarchal world, whether Homer is a tradition or whether Homer is a person, Homer existed in a patriarchal world. So I wonder if you have felt that as a translator, it is your responsibility to sort of recreate a patriarchal world. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, in some senses, you have to. Right. I mean, I'm not going to change the story, right? And I'm not going to change any any element of what the what the text is saying. I mean, not, at least I'm not going to sort of try and... I, I see that it says that um, that Odysseus left Calypso, but in fact, I, I think it would be better if he stayed there. I'm going to change that. I don't do that. I mean, I, I try and bring out every element that I see in each line, in each word. Um, but I, it, it depends how you shape the story, right? I mean, if, if you can translate the exact same sentence in a totally accurate way, but with a different tone. So what I, what I want to do is just make sure that everything is that I see there, or as much as I can bring out, that I think is visible, should be visible. And that might include inviting people to, to see this is about inequality, rather than just in, using a, a narrative or poetic mode which suggests, please don't think about this, it's back in the day, it's historical, you know? So I think there are ways that, that if you write more clearly and you're more clear about what's actually happening in the text, you can invite more a, a more critical discourse in response. Do you think, though, that Homer intentionally, like, don't, don't you think that it was Homer's intention to portray Calypso as an over-sexualized, uh, lascivious, greedy, desiring uh, nymph? I don't, I don't see that. I mean, I, I, I don't I think... Homer's intention, it doesn't really make sense because, you know, this poem is based on a centuries old tradition. It's a it's folk art. It's it's the product of many different people. Um, if there even if, if we imagine that there was a single person who wrote it down in the late eighth or early seventh century, can we ever reconstruct the mind of that person? All we have is, is the text. I don't see in that scene is the text showing us or hinting that there's something wrong with Calypso. I just don't see that. I, I see that it's presenting, it's showing us in a um, in a really, really acute way um, what she's like, how she feels, um, and it's also constantly using the dignified epithets like Potnia Thea. She's a revered goddess. 
you don't describe a character in Homer like right. that. Right. You want to give dignity to the character. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it makes sense to say that, of course, because we imagine that the archaic Greeks must have been far more sexist than we are, then we're going to project all the modern sexism back onto the portrayals of Calypso, even if we don't have textual evidence. I think we actually would need a lot more textual evidence than we have to say that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, it's not, that I, it's not that I think there's no inequality in the Odyssey. Of course there is. But I just think it's handled much more subtly than some of the translations would lead you to believe. I want to talk a little bit more about then translation theory. Um, ultimately, what would you say then makes for a good translation of, of an ancient bard like Homer? Um, what is the translator's ultimate goal? Um, I've, I've heard, I know nothing about translation theory, but I've heard words kicking around uh, like equivalence. Is a good translator tr striving to achieve some kind of precise, semantic, functional equivalence in terms of, say, just reproducing the original Greek tale, like turning the words used to tell the original tale into equivalent English words that mean the same thing? Or is translation more like an interpretation? Uh, is, is translation like trying to arrive at a valid or sound interpretation? So in, in your translation of Homer's Odyssey, are you trying to be faithful to something or are you telling a new story? The, I, I think people sometimes have, a, have an idea of, trans, of something being possible in translation, which isn't possible. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's not possible to take a time machine, get back to exactly the experience that people in the 7th century BC were having when they, when they were listening to the Odyssey. And they were also were fluent um, un comprehenders of Homeric Greek, which, of course, also is a language which nobody ever spoke. We, we can imagine that time machine, but it's not, ne that time machine is never going to take us to an English poem in, in now. And no, and no, even if, I mean, my experience of reading the Greek poem is totally different from my experience of reading my translation or any translation. And that's always going to be the case. However responsible the translator is, an English poem is never the same as a Greek poem. So I think that the, these notions like equivalence or faithfulness, I mean, they're always very loaded metaphors. And I'm not sure, I think they, they help people circle around the, the thing that we don't want to admit, which is that a translation is always a different text mm -hmm. from the original. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think interpretation is a more useful place to begin because it, and and then it can take you to. It has to be a very responsible, very thoughtful kind of interpretation, and then it maybe it can also take you to to thinking about. Um, so what do we have to be equivalent to? What do we have to be responsible to? I mean, clearly there were questions about that, right? I mean, you could say, I could I could translate the the, the Odyssey sort of word by word, keeping the word order of the original. That would make for incomprehensible English. The Greek is not incomprehensible. Incompre so I would be betraying something, even while I was being faithful to something. You know, I could I could translate it into dactylic hexameter, and I might hint at the music of the original, but then I would end up paying a cost in terms of how much is it like, is it like a like an English poem or like a, like a poem that, that's recognisable as a poem? I could translate it into. You know, I could I could say more or less the same thing either in very highfalutin language or in. Cockney slang, or you know, there were all these different stylistic questions of what exactly is the style of Homer? How do we get to an equivalence of whatever the reading experience is of somebody who's either listening in the seventh century or who has a super good knowledge of Homeric Greek, listening or reading to or reading the original? And I think it's not it's not like there's a sort of single answer to this is equivalent to that. And I mean, there's no word in any other language that sort of exactly the forms performs exactly the same function. Because languages come in a whole sem semantic and cultural system, right? You can't just sort of pick out one bit of the fabric and then plonk it in somewhere else. Right, right. And, and I know that language evolves and changes. But when I'm approaching a text like the Odyssey, uh, there's a part of me that wants to that that wants an expert, someone who knows both languages, to be able to deliver me the qualia, you know, what it is like to be me reading the English translation of the odyssey immersed in the story of odysseus's journey i want that qualia to match as closely as possible the qualia of someone who is able to experience the original is that naive of me is it inaccurate no i, th I think that's not naive at all I and mean, that's what i want from a translation as well i mean i think i just we just need to acknowledge that it's not going to be, it's never going to be quite the same qualia and also that the translator is going to make choices about what she thinks that those qualia are which uh, again as i as i said before an equally responsible 
reader might say might make different choices about what the qualia are. I mean, mm -hmm. what I what, I think I know Homeric Greek very well. The the Odyssey that I read is not the same as you know the Odyssey that some other scholar reads with different interpretive ideas about what matters in the text. It might be it's really going to be very close, but it's not going to be identical. Right, right. So if you were to humor me, humor my romantic side, um, which English translation, yeah. and you can't pick your own uh, because you're biased <laughs> and you like your own the best, which English translation would you recommend for someone who wants to read the version of the Odyssey that most closely captures what Homer was trying to get across? And, and what is your, what is your <laughs> favorite translation? It's not the intentions of Homer. He doesn't have intentions, or she okay. doesn't, or they don't okay. have intentions. But um, I think it's, I mean, maybe this takes us to, um, it depends what you're trying to achieve with a translation, or who it's for, and why. I mean, I personally most love the Chapman translation, which is from oh. 1615. Um, and I think if you want an oldie, timey translation, go for one that's actually 400 years old. Um, it's a great poem, and it's, um, it, it, I think it's very different from the original, very different from mine. Chapman has his own preoccupations. Um, he was a dr verse dramatist and a neo-Stoic, neo so he, I think he brings out very well the dramatic qualities of the, of the Odyssey, and he wrestles, um, I think, in interesting ways with the ethics of the poem and with Isidesius, the, the patient, suffering, abused hero who's going to have a quasi-Christian journey towards um, some kind of revelation. And I think he, what's interesting about it also is that Chapman can also, is, he's a good enough reader of the Greek to realize that doesn't entirely fit. So it's a very interesting sort of interpretive um, creation. Um, I also love the Pope, which is very different, but I think I love Chapman even more than Pope. So Pope um, was more flowery, right? He was more, he was, he was using the highfalutin, you know, s fancy. Yeah. He goes, he goes time with metaphors, yes. And it's great. And, and he definitely, I mean, all translators have an interpretation, or if, even if they haven't thought about it. I think it's worse if they haven't thought about it than if they have thought about it. Mm. Um, Pope's, Pope's interpretation is, is much more to do with, this is a poem about etiquette. It's so Odysseus is being tested about, about to, to see if he's you know, a good gentleman in all these, <laughs> these difficult case, difficult social cues. And what do you, what do you say when you're in the cave of the, of the, of the, of the man-eating monster? And Odysseus is the, is the correct kind of British gentleman who's able to, to solve that social dilemma. That's so great. <laughs> it's just so funny. And it's, and it's great. And, he, and it's, a, it's a wonderful exercise. It's a, it's a wonderful text. The Pope Odyssey. So you seem to think that each translation of of the Odyssey or, or whatever work we're talking about, each translation has its own has its own function, has its own has its own purpose, serves its yep. own unique and if it's, it's if it's well done, if it's honest, its own valid function intellectually. I think so, sort of. I mean, I think there's also, I mean. On particular levels, you can say this is better than that, right? I mean, so just going back to the, the question of when Telemachus um, says he's going to hang the slaves, if you import abusive language that isn't there in the Greek, on that level, it's worse, right? I mean, it's less truthful to the original if you sort of say, I'm going to make him call them sluts when the original calls him calls them those women. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I think you can make judgments. I mean, you can say... This is the this is the particular way that this translation is skewed. These are the th kinds of things this translator doesn't see. These are the kinds of ways this translation veers away from the original. I mean, like Robert Fagels, he's uh, I, I, I think there are reasons why everybody loves the Robert Fagels translations. They're very expansive. I mean, very often where there's one adjective in Homer, Fagels will give you two or three. I mean, like sluts and whores, where there's no adjective at all, but he gives you plenty of adjectives. Can I say he's something on his side though? Yeah, 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 yes. I felt like I read the Lattimore translation, and then I got the I yeah. got the um, I got the Fagels afterwards. So I did the last episode of this show on the Lattimore translation. Yeah. I picked up Fagels, and I thought his prose was so beautiful and evocative. I think he means poetry, metrical poetry. It's poetry. It's laid out like poetry. Yes, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I think he has this wonderful energy and and high feeling in how he writes and pe people relate to it for sure and, and I, I definitely I think I related to it more when I was younger when I read the Fagels after reading I think the Lattimore um, when I was I guess like 18 or so and I loved it at, at that age I mean I thought it was 
exciting. And certainly compared to the Lattimore or the Penguin Pros one, it was it engages you. Yeah. Right? But I do think that there are particular ways that it's it's quite free with what it's doing with the Greek. And I think the the way that he goes for melodrama and sentimentalizing is again quite far from what the Greek is doing. And I'm not sure that I fully like that. I mean I think if you're in the mood for a very melodramatic and sentimentalized approach to the Odyssey, it's great. And and sometimes you are in that mood. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, what is your favorite translation? Which one do you like the most? Which one do you think does does what it's supposed to do? I mean, I know I, I'm trying to get away from this idea that there's some uh, perfect original platonic form of the Odyssey story just floating in some metaphysical realm somewhere. But but what kind of gets it right in your opinion? What comes the closest? I mean, the thing is that I wouldn't have done my translation if I felt if, like there was another one out there that did what I wanted. That, that did what I thought needed to be done. Well, know? what did you I mean, recommend to your students before you the, translated this? Yes. So I, I um, when I, I mean, I'm also involved in the Norton Anthology of World Literature, and the one I put, we used to have the Fagels, which, I, as I say, I think there's a lot, lot to love in the Fagels. Um, and then we switched, I switched over to the Stanley Lombardo one, which I think has different virtues. It has a sort of starkness, and it's a very... Um, Simple. It's a relatively fast read, which I think is good for particular kinds of reading experience. I mean, if it's for freshman undergraduates, you need to make sure that it's going to be clear and that they, the narrative arc is, is very comprehensible. I mean, I hope that's also comprehensible. I hope the narrative arc is also very visible in mine, but you know, before me, the Lombardo had a clearer narrative arc than any of the others that I could see. Okay. So um, yeah. how did the how did the process work in, in translating the Odyssey? When you're translating, how, walk me through the mechanics. Do you translate word for word? Do you read an entire sentence and then take a step back and ask yourself, what does this mm -hmm. cluster of words seek to convey connotatively, yeah. denotatively? And how should I capture that meaning in English? Or do you read a sentence in the original Greek and combine sort of combine that with a feeling that you get with it with the with the feeling it produces in you are you trying to think of Eng english words that would produce in readers of our generation um a similar feeling or mood that was intended by homer um like if if greek produces in you a sense of awe or wonder is it about finding the right english words to produce that same feeling or is or is this all more mm -hmm. linguistic for you? And and I was going to ask you also, how do you capture the rhythm, the 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 rhythm and the beauty? How do you engineer your text to produce the same feelings? So I mean, word for word, obviously, you can't, you can't just sort of pick out the first word of the sentence and plonk down an English equivalent of that, and then move on to the second word of the sentence. That would would be again result in nonsense. So I would read a, you know a passage, a a verse paragraph, and I would. What I would usually do is read it out loud, read it over and over several times, and then I would also look at commentaries, look at diction, look up in the dictionary and any words where I wasn't totally sure I understood the connotation, and then look at how is this word used elsewhere in Homer, how is it used elsewhere in Greek, just make sure that I had as full a sense as I possibly could of um, how, what, what function is both um, this whole passage doing, what kind of music does it have, what kinds of things is it conveying, all the multitude of things that any passage is conveying, um, and then also what is this particular word doing. And then I would write out a, a draft of a tra of translation, and then I would re read aloud my translation and fix whatever I didn't like, or sometimes I would just get stuck on single words or single phrases, and it wasn't always the ones that were difficult in Greek. I mean, sometimes it was just, there wasn't actually a, an exact equivalent of that in English, and there's no, I wouldn't have necessarily known that I would spend three weeks on that word, but sometimes I did, you know, wow. it was unpredictable. Um, and then just sort of thinking about English synonyms, and I know that there is no no exact word for this particular kind of cunning, so what, what are the synonyms for cunning, wily, crafty, all that, I mean, just going through these different possibilities. But then also, because my, my version is both um, iambic pentameter and it's the same length as the original there was also this whole set of choices that had to do with how your constraints how fast i wanted it to be 
I, it was constraints or you know deliberate. I, I wanted to be in those prisons because it, I felt like those were the ways to to avoid doing the self indulgent um, expanding on the original. But I wanted to make sure I'm not doing that. I'm going to keep to the pacing of the original, even if it's not that every line in the in the Greek has all the words in ev in that same line in the English. Mine is the same length as the original, so it's very close to um, to, to the to the pace to the timing of the original. Hmm. So I mean, a lot of reading out, reading out loud of both the original and the English. I'm not sure that I can distinguish between cognitive, linguistic, emotional, um, psychological, musical, narrative point of view. I mean, all these things, of course, all of those things have to be in play, right? I mean, there, there has to be a sense both of I'm going to be picking up on here's this pun and here's this alliteration and I won't necessarily replicate those things in the exact moment when they're there in the Greek, but I, I'm aware that they're there and I need to know that they're there. Yes, but I definitely did a lot of rereading re my drafts and then going back, going back and rereading the Greek and reading my drafts out loud to different people as well, which was very helpful. And just sort of thinking through not just um, how have I dealt with this particular passage, but do I have a an overall characterization of Telemachus that makes sense? Do I have a character? Do I feel like I know where Athena is coming from in this passage? And are, are, are all the word choices that I'm using shaping a picture that's coherent? Okay. Uh, so I mean, that kind of thing was important to me as well. But then also just on the level of detail, very often when I would read it out loud for the fifth time, I would realize actually I don't like that word or the rhythm is off in line three or that kind of thing as well. How long did it take you, uh, Dr. Wilson? How long did this whole thing take you? I had five years. I mean, obviously I did, it wasn't like necessarily 24 seven, but right. five years, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I want to talk about a couple of individual lines that you translated. I want to I want to start with the proem, and I know everyone lingers on that um, and sort of obsesses with the proem. Um, uh, I think because it's so well known, the proem is so well known in the Odyssey, and and it's distinctive. I think and it's really the first thing that the reader learns about um, Odysseus, and it's the first thing when someone's picking up your translation where they get to they they get to get a sense of your judgment as a translator. I. I first want to read the various ways in which some of the other influential translators have translated um, the proem of the Odyssey, um, and then I want to take a look at yours. So I'm going to start with Chapman, and I just want to read a few, and I want to get sort of get your thoughts after I'm done reading these. So Chapman says, The man, O muse, inform that many a way wound with his wisdom to his wished stay. Uh, Pope writes, the man for wisdom's various arts renowned, long exercised in woes, O muse, resound. Uh, William Cullen Bryant writes, tell me, O muse, of that sagacious man who, having overthrown the sacred town, um, and I actually had to look up sagacious because I wanted to get a, a precise sense of what that means. And it means having or showing keen mental discernment and good judgment. So I thought that was actually kind of an appropriate word to use, maybe. It's a it doesn't get the metaphor, but it's a, it's a Latinism from sagas. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Lattimore, Lattimore, Lattimore says, Tell me, muse, of the man of many ways who has driven far journeys. Um, and... and just knowing what the word polutropos means, uh, it means what uh, many multiple ways, something like that, right? Turning, turning, much many turning. multiple turnings. Tropos, like, like a trope, right? What's a trope in English? It's a, it's something where this is the turning point, right? The, um, yeah. Okay. So it, and then Fitzgerald says, sing in me, muse, and through me tell the story of that man skilled in all ways of contending. That's interesting. And then Fagel says, sing to me of the man, muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course. Lombardo says, speak memory of the cunning hero. And then I, and we arrive at yours. Tell me about a complicated man, muse. Tell me how he wandered and was lost. And I had to look up complicated, too, because I, I wanted to see where you were coming from. And, and the definition that I got was consisting of many interconnecting parts or elements, intricate, difficult to analyze, understand, or explain. And so, to be honest, uh, Dr. Wilson, at first, I wasn't sure how I felt about complicated. I, mm -hmm. I actually yeah. thought of the Avril Lavigne song, and I, 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 I wondered, is she bringing 
21st century words in to describe Odysseus that wouldn't yeah. really apply to him. Um, I'm a high school teacher, so I hear the word complicated most often from my teenage students uh, who time and again refer to their relationships as complicated. Yeah, yeah. They're so, it, it's complicated. Um, so, so I was reading Daniel Mendelssohn's book, um, An Odyssey, uh, A Father, A Son, and an Epic, and reading his book helped me understand actually where you were coming from. He has a very long section about the word polutropos. Um, and, and along with that, and, and possibly because I'm not a classicist by training and I, have, uh, I haven't read the Odyssey a thousand times like you have, it didn't hit me until I read the Odyssey again and again and until I read Daniel's book just how complicated and complex and hard to read Odysseus is. Um, it -hmm. reminds me of what the biographer Edmund Morris says about Ronald Reagan. Edmund Morris says he was truly one of the strangest men who's ever lived. Nobody around him understood him. I, every person I interviewed, almost without exception, eventually would say, you know, I never really could figure him out. Um, so that was a quote by, by Edmund Morris. And I actually started to feel this way about Odysseus after reading the Odyssey again, after reading uh, Daniel's book. He's shady, he's devious, he's heroic, but he lets all of his men get killed out at sea. Um, he's tricky, but yeah. he's but he's also loyal. He's 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 loyal, but he's mm-hmm. constantly sleeping around. He's intelligent and strong, but he's also kind mm-hmm. of clumsy sometimes mm-hmm. and unlucky. Yeah. He's a violent uh, patriarch, but also a sensitive, careful, and well-spoken strategizer. And he's manly mm-hmm. and rugged, but he cries all the time. So I know I'm I'm oversimplifying everything here, but. But I actually started to agree with you. And I think in terms of making the most of a word that literally means many or multiple turns, as you said, um, Odysseus is a man who is complicated. He is complicated. That's Mm -hmm. what he is. So I thought you made a really good, I thought you made a really good choice. Tell me about this choice. How did you make it? How did you have the courage to make (laughs) this choice? And how do you view Odysseus as a character? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess, so polytropos is actually a relatively unusual epithet in terms of the multiple epithets of Odysseus. He's described um, as many, many things, right? So he's much turning, polytropos, but he's also polymechanos, he has many stratagems. He's also polytlas, he's very enduring or very patient or much, much daringness. Um, he's also um, polymetis, he has a whole lot of braininess, of cunning. <laughs> Um, So there's this whole, which is very, very unusual among Homeric epic heroes. um, Achilles is swift-footed, and he just goes on being swift-footed. Whereas Odysseus, he's multiple, and he goes on being multiple. He's multiply multiple. So people focus on polythropos, but I think it's actually important that it's actually a relatively unusual epithet in terms of the epithets of Odysseus. He's much more often polymechanos than he is polythropos. Um, Which I think, in a way, that makes one think, so what's special about turning at the start of the poem? And and one of the reasons why, I mean, in a way, right now I'm bored of complicated. I'm like, on the second edition, I'm definitely going to rewrite that first line. It's going to be totally different. I throw everyone a curveball, yes, I'm not going to tell you what. Anyway, but maybe I won't. But so I, I guess what I wanted to do was complicated was both um, to invite a, a sense of the layers and turns within the character that he's both somebody who's, who is turned around in the course of his journeys. I mean, literally, he goes, goes to Troy and he turns around and comes back again. And then he turns around all the way on the way. He's, but yes. then there are also turns inside him that he's always twisting the truth and turning things, turning things around. There are layers in, in his character. Um, but then the, the, it's also, uh, to me, it was very important that polythropos, from what we can gather of the usage of the word in later Greek, it's used by, for instance, Thucydides to describe situations. So it's not just a word for people. Um, so it seemed to me important that, that I should choose a word that was going to describe the poem as well as describe the guy. So I mean, that's part of where I came from in thinking complicated would work because it's, it, it, it is like the original, a word which describes the situation. Or a poem, it's, and, and I'm ideally wanting it to be a sort of marker to the reader to say, you may think that this is an easy story because you already know the myth, but it's a complicated story, as well as a complicated character. And that's what I realized. And so, and 
so in in one sense he's um, he is polutropos in his mind he can strategize he can he can think on his feet in one sense you're saying he's polutropos in a way that has very little to do with him he's he's being toyed with by the gods he's being tossed from from yeah. island to island he's dealing with right. many different strange so alien situations inside him he's, he's also in complicated situations yes right and, and places he's, he's turned around yeah and he's constantly going in a circle and and also his relationship yeah. he's a man of many different complicated relationships as well and so so yeah so exactly, yeah i think the whole the discussion of the prime um i mean i i hope that people read past the first line because i think the way that the poem sets up that this is a poem that she's not just about the nostos or homecoming of odysseus what, the, what those first lines tell us is about the people who didn't get home the people who didn't have a nostos right. but i think it, it's in a way it's very surprising that this poem about odysseus first it doesn't name him i mean it, it, it says andra i man and I think it's important for me. It was important to make sure I didn't use a definite article. I mean, most of those translations you cited make it that man or the man, and I make it a man because I think that's closer to what the original is doing. It's a person, a human being, a man. He's a man, and it tells us about how there were all these other men. Those men died at Troy, or they were lost on the way. They didn't get to come home. And I just wanted to. to it seems to me really important in the original. I hope it's visible in my translation that it's not just one person's homecoming story. It's the story of all the people who don't get to go home. Right, right. And it's the story of, I don't know, that was one of the things I thought was great about the Odyssey is that it's also Penelope's story. It's also mm -hmm. Telemachus's story. Um, it's in many ways, it's also, I, I don't know, you get a, you get a kind of story about the gods, about Athena. Um, I want to I want to read another translated passage. I'll I'll read Lattimore's translation first, and then I'll read yours. This dialogue comes from 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 Odysseus when he's speaking to Nausicaa on the island of Scaria, um, and the concept I believe is Homa Um Odysseus says, "I'm going to start with the Lattimore translation." May the gods give you everything, and I'm quoting here. May the gods give you everything that your heart longs for, and he's speaking to Nausicaa. May they grant you a husband and a house and sweet agreement in all things, for nothing is better than this, more steadfast, than when two people, a man and his wife, keep a harmonious household, a thing that brings much distress to the people who hate them and pleasure to their well-wishers, and for them, the best reputation. Now I'm going to read your translation, which is very different. Quote, May the gods grant all your heart's desires, a home and a husband, somebody like-minded. For nothing could be better than when two live in one house, their minds in harmony, husband and wife. Their enemies are jealous, their friends delighted, and they have great honor. So Lattimore seems to describe Homa Frasune as sweet agreement in all things, and has Odysseus elaborate that nothing is better, more steadfast than when two people, a man and his wife, keep a harmonious household. And you say, in a sense, that Homa Frasune is somebody like-minded, not a not a not a harmonious household, somebody like-minded. And then you have Odysseus elaborate that nothing could be better when two live in one house, their minds in harmony, husband mm -hmm. and wife. So in your translation, it seems to be about minds being in harmony. For Lattimore, it's about it's about the household in general. It's about the thing that the the two people create together and maintain. Um, the household being in harmony. Whereas for you, it seems to be about like two people just living together, but they have this mental and spiritual compatibility. I like your translation. It's certainly more modern, and I actually think it's more romantic. Um, but would the Odysseus we know really say this, Dr. Wilson? So, I mean, I guess one just philological thing. So homo prosune, homo means like, and prosune, it connotes mind, mind or outlook. Um, it's a cognitive quality. So it is, it, I mean, like-mindedness is, is an accurate translation. Um, I think we need to remember the context, which is so often distorted. I mean, I, I loved Daniel Mendelssohn's book, but I think he very much distorts the context of the Homophosuna line. It's, it's, Odysseus is an older guy chatting up a teenage girl. He's not saying, I mean, he's not, he's not saying, I'm married, by the way. He's saying, 
you're so beautiful. I've never seen anybody like you. And let me tell you some, some sexy, romantic things. So I think it's very important to see both um, that it's a lovely romantic ideal and it's a very sleazy context. Um, such that I don't think we can then map on to this is really what Odysseus thinks about marriage. This is what Odysseus says about marriage for particular purposes. Um, I don't think it's, that we're given reason to think his marriage with Penelope is like this. Mm. I, mean, I think in many ways, you know, Odysseus has many long-term relationships. He has a long-term relationship with Calypso where they have this, um, in a way, a version of like-mindedness that they both like um, they both like scheming and hiding, and that there's that wonderful moment when she's delighted that he doesn't believe her, that, there's, that the lack of trust is what binds them together. Mm. Um, and then he has another relationship with Circe. He has a, the longest-term relationship with Athena. And there's a wonderful exchange in Book 13 where they're sort of flirting with each other and telling each other, you're even better, better at lying than I am. And I thought I was good. And it, yeah. It's great. And it just shows this is that's that's what like mindedness is in this poem. It's these relationships where he's eight where his his playful qualities, his artful qualities, his his whole range of disguising is disguising himself. That's something which he shares in different ways with Calypso and with Athena. And he certainly doesn't share that in the same way with Penelope. Um I mean he shares different things with Penelope. But I think it shows shows us this range of different relationships that he has, whereby I mean, putting it all on the, on the Odysseus Penelope relationship is sort of leaving out such a huge right. set of things in the poem. That's a really good point. I never thought of that. Um, and But at the same time, I, I actually read that scene with uh, Nausicaa differently. I'm looking at it like, here's Odysseus. He's exhausted. He's naked. He's vulnerable. He's washed up on the shores of Scoria, and he sees... A woman. I mean, I don't know. Is is Nausicaa a teenager in the way that we think of teenagers, or is she a woman, open to being married, uh, doing doing the laundry? She seems to be the boldest one of the group. She stands up and she kind of older than her slaves. Yes, <laughs> that's that's true. The owner to be to be. But she says, them. "Don't be afraid of this man. There's no reason to be afraid of him. In fact, let's help him." And she seems really strong. Um, I mean, she's Strong. I mean, I'm not at all meaning, meaning to diminish the the courage and power of the portrayal of Nausicaa, um, but I think she's definitely portrayed as this, you know, vulnerable, um, vulnerable and strong girl. That she, and she's uh, clearly uh, she's portrayed at a turning point in her life. That she knows she's ready to get married. She doesn't know if her father knows that yet. She doesn't know to what extent is. Is her marriage going to be something that she chooses as opposed to something her parents choose? I mean, there's this whole um, sort of framing of how much is, is um, the nympha, the unmarried girl, allowed to be an autonomous agent. And mm. now she comes this wonderful image of a at least quasi-autonomous agent who's you know able to go do the laundry. Um, and it's a big trip, and she's able to steal up her courage to ask her dad for the for the wagon and ask her mum for the lovely packed lunch. And it, it, I, mean, I, lo I love the whole Nasica sequence. I love the way that it includes both total ordinariness of, you know, you're going to do laundry, you're going to have, have a packed lunch, but then also magicalness as well. And right. also just deep human truth about, you know, what is it like to be in, in a turning point of your life where you're not quite sure what sexual desire is, but you know you might be feeling it now. And on, and on Odysseus's part, I, I guess I never saw it as him being sleazy. In this moment, I thought obviously, but I think that's a part, definitely part of what's going on. It's not the only thing that's going on. It's partly his Pelutropos, though, right? It's the cunning side of the Pelutropos, where he is saying what he needs to say to be invited to Alcinous and Arete's table to to be fed and sent home, right? Yes. And yes, he's very, he's very smart, and he talks for a very long time. And he's. I love that speech. Yes, it's a great speech. Yes, and it, I think it's very easy for the reader as well as Nausicaa to be seduced by that speech. And I, I admire her her courage that she comes back with a the comeback, which suggests that she's able to not be totally. Um, that she 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 puts up a little bit of resistance to the speech, even though she also, of course, helps him. It works. Yeah. Right. Right. So. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Penelope as, as one of the last topics here that I want to bring up with you. Um, I want to ask you if Penelope, if we can consider her as some kind of early feminist. I mean, for me, the predicament that she's in in this book, where she's asking herself, am I a wife or am I a widow? Um, 
should I stay loyal to my husband who's been gone a really, really, really unreasonably long time? Um, Or is my husband dead? In which case I have to figure what out what I'm going to do. I have to I have to marry one of these gross suitors. Um, Telemachus is not the man that Odysseus is, and Penelope seems to me to be a woman who's trying to figure out who she is throughout the book and remaining strong. Um, she's doing the trick with the loom. She's she's not just a you know weak vulnerable, helpless woman, even though she's not, you know, the wife of Bath or Medea. There's been a whole debate in classical scholarship about how to read Penelope and to what extent is it a feminist reading if you present her as a totally empowered woman? Okay. So, I mean, I think I would talk about a feminist reading as opposed to, well, obviously, obviously Penelope hasn't read Germaine Greer. <laughs> I, I'm not, I don't think I would argue that. Um, Where do you I mean, stand? I think in a way, if you're looking... I, so I think, I mean, asking is, Calypso is the one who says it's not fair because the male gods judge themselves by different standards from the female gods. That's true. But Penelope never says that. Um, I think we have, you know, we have this trio of elite women in the, uh, elite wives in the Odyssey. We have Helen, who's this wonderfully smart, um, in a way, Odyssean weaver of stories, weaver of disguises, um, controller of appearances, um, we, who, who is also, of course, the adulteress, but who's judging? And then we also have Calypso. I mean, we also have Clytemnestra always in the background as you don't want the wife like that. The wife is going to kill you when you get back home. Um, and we never actually sort of get to hear Clytemnestra's point of view, but she's always the dark, can- she and Helen are the dark counterparts of Penelope. And I think the Penelope that we see in this poem is a Penelope who's, who's constantly just defined by the constraints that are put around her. That when we get to get access to her mind is through her dreams, because those are the only places where she can move. Um, and then we have that wonderful sequence in book 19 where she talks about her her dream about the geese, when Odysseus is still in disguise, and he ha- and the, there hasn't been the recognition yet, he's still the homeless old beggar. And she tells the, the story of how she dreamed that there were geese in her yard, and then an eagle swooped in and killed all the geese. And then the eagle said, I'm your husband, I'm going to come back and kill all the suitors. And she says, in my dream, I was crying because the eagle killed my geese. And Odysseus responds by saying, there's no possible misinterpretation of this dream. It means I'm going to come back and kill the suitors. Great. Yay. But it, I think what it shows is this real complexity in Penelope's psyche that, that who knows what she wants. Maybe she doesn't want those suitors to be killed. And that would be a fairly reasonable thing not to want that. But it's also clear, I think, in the portrayal of Penelope that she knows she's not necessarily going to get what she wants. I mean, the way that she's constantly describing her marriage is it's located in the time when he left. And from the time that he left me, I've been mocked. My, my, my face has been mocked. My bed has been mocked. My whole heart, house is stained by the, this abandonment and this loss. Um, and she also knows that you know she can put off the suitors forever, but then her father and her brothers are pressuring her to marry somebody. So it's not she only in contrast to Odysseus, who is Polu in all these different ways. He's many. He has many choices, many places. He can travel. He, he's always always leaving, always turning around. She doesn't have choices. She there's potentially the choice to choose one man or choose another man, but even that is a constrained kind of choice. Right. And then I was just looking at the, like another 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 passage um, at that moment when. Um, when Odysseus, still in the skies, describes Odysseus to Penelope, and she starts crying, and it's like her face is melting, like the snow that melts on the mountaintops. And that's how she cried and cried. And I, I, I looked at other translations of that passage, I mean, after I, just a couple of days ago, because I was curious about how other people had done it. And I realized that it's very often very normalized, such that people say her, her tears were running down her face, or... Her tears were melting. But what the original says is that her face was melting. Her cheeks were melting. So I think she has, she's presented as having this experience of disintegration, that, she's, um, that her relationship with her husband, her love for her husband, or her, her difficult feelings about him and about her whole um, constrained situation are experienced as this death of the self. Um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't see it as a non-feminist move to say that. I mean, to say that this is a poem which evokes 
how horrible it is to be a very competent, very smart person who has such limited choices. How about Cersei? So, not- Cersei, the the uh, the uh, taking care of the the male chauvinist pigs. What do you think about Cersei? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I think Cersei's great. It's, it's it's a fun episode in the poem. Um, I mean, in a way, I think the the whole Cersei episode also says very interesting things about Odysseus's relationship with his men, right? I mean, the way that he forces them to go go back to the palace of Cersei and says, you know, if you don't go back, I'm going to chop your head off because you know, he's that kind of leader. Um, but I think it's it's in, it's interesting how there's both this sort of parallelism with the with Calypso, but between Circe and Calypso, they're in some ways very similar, but also very different. I mean, there's this sort of literal literalization of what happens on Calypso's island in the island of Circe, that instead of just keeping the man in hiding where his human or masculine identity is under the shadow of the intertwining cave, on Circe's island, it's sort of, it's it's a literal hiding of, of the masculine or in, into the brutish. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the... I have things to say. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm sure this past year has been a whirlwind for you. Are you currently working on anything new that you would like to tell my listeners about? Any new endeavors? Any um, uh, any new things that you're publishing or working on? So I'm doing a translation of Sophocles' Oedipus Tyrannus for Norton Critical Editions, um, which is a really interestingly different project because the style is so different from Homeric poetic style. It's so much more densely metaphorical. I mean, whereas I had to um, figure out how to do the similes in Homer, with Sophocles, so much of the language is about metaphor and just how to work in, work in the metaphors and not give up whatever seems most essential about these de- very dense, difficult metaphors. So I'm doing that. And then maybe I'll do the Iliad. I'm, I'm just mulling that over right now, but I may do the Iliad. Are you going to reveal what word you're replacing complicated with here on this show? No, I'm not. I haven't decided yet. And I may not do it. You never know. But it's, I, I just I like the, I think it's useful just to realize that this translation isn't necessarily set in, set in stone even once it's published, right? I mean, it's, there's always possibilities for rethinking, and it's always a human creation. It's yeah. always a human set of decisions. Yeah such that I think one can sort of think, oh, that must be the real thing, the only possible thing. And maybe also, as you, you asked me at the start of the conversation about determinism, about whether I see it, if you're born in this particular place, this particular family, must you do X, Y, Z? And I don't think that at all. And I also don't think that a translation is a deterministic process. I think it's a, it's a constant se- sequence of judgments, rethinking, deeper thinking, more judgments, and just trying to get deeper and deeper to understanding something. Well, I appreciate that position. It's a very, it's a very um, humble, modest uh, position for someone who probably wants their translation to be successful and to last a long time. I actually appreciate you being able to say, you know, this, it's always changing. This isn't, this isn't it. You know, I could, I could change it. I could publish a second edition and change it. And (laughs) so I appreciate that actually. So thank you very much for, for being on this program. Um, uh, it was wonderful talking to you. Great. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks. you so much for talking. Have okay. a good one. And you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. So now I want to focus on a final theme that I think is both important for understanding the Odyssey um, and also relevant for today's times. So remember, the first four books of the Odyssey, and again, if you're looking for a detailed summary of the Odyssey that covers all of the major plot points, you should go back and listen to episode three of this podcast. The first four books follow the drama of Odysseus's son, Telemachus. More specifically, the first two books, uh, they give us an up-close look at Odysseus's homeland, Ithaca, and how his family is getting by in his absence. At this point in the story, as we get to know Telemachus and his mother, Odysseus, the father, has been gone for nearly 20 years. And as I mentioned before, this has caused innumerable problems for Telemachus and his mother. Things on Ithaca are in a horrible disarray. Odysseus's beautiful, intelligent wife, Penelope, is again being courted by a mass of grubby and grasping suitors who are growing impatient without their king. Uh, They're assuming that he, Odysseus, is long dead. The suitors, there are a hundred and eight of them. 
They're consuming the island's resources. They're killing Odysseus's livestock. And they're pressuring Penelope. The boldest of them are actually hoping to take over Odysseus's household, to take possession of Telemachus's inheritance, and to rule Ithaca. Now, Telemachus himself, who, remember, has been raised without a father, is, I think, a fairly intelligent guy. Um, but I think to a large degree he is also, um, because he hasn't had a father to guide him, he is ineffectual and immature, and I, I almost want to say weak, um, as a man. Telemachus, remember, has, has never met his father, and he's also confused about his status. Is he guarding his father's house and kingdom? Should he be waiting for his father to come back? Or is Ithaca his kingdom now? Uh, should he be trying to claim his home and his kingdom as an independent grown man? Should he be trying to marry his mother off? What is he supposed to do? Now, you got to realize the suitors have t literally taken over Odysseus's home. They are in there. They are in his house um, in, in Odysseus's absence. And the only thing Telemachus seems to be able to do is watch, which is painful as a reader, um, as they, quote, kill his flocks of sheep and longhorn cattle unstoppably. And again, this is from the Emily Wilson translation. So this is why Athena, the patron goddess of heroic endeavor and of wisdom, she goes to Odysseus's homeland, she goes to Ithaca, and she comes to Telemachus's aid. She must, quote, go to Ithaca to rouse the courage of Odysseus's son, and, quote, make him call a meeting and speak out against the suitors, after which she will, quote, send him off to Pylos and to Sparta to seek news about his father's journey home, so that he can, quote, gain a noble reputation for himself. Now, if you think about it, it is interesting um, and a bit telling that a goddess has to come down and actually make Telemachus stand up for his family and his homeland as it's being undermined and threatened by these grasping suitors. Remember, Telemachus is 20 years old, which is only a few years younger than King Odysseus was when he left Ithaca to fight in the Trojan War. We also get the sense that, uh, and this is almost a certainty, that were Odysseus to come back at this very moment... All of the trouble with these suitors and the corresponding chaos reigning the island would instantly come to an end. Odysseus would take care of this problem. And he does, eventually. So there seems to be a major difference between the father and the son. So that is Athena's plan. When she gets to Ithaca, she is disguised as Mentes, a war buddy of Odysseus's. We get a clear sense of what Telemachus has been allowing to go on in his father's absence. When Athena gets to Ithaca, she found the, quote, lordly suitors sitting on hides. They killed the cows themselves and playing checkers, attentive house slaves waiting on them. So the suitors are in there forcing the house uh, slaves to wait on them, playing checkers, getting drunk, playing games, eating all the meat. Um, they, quote, carved up heaping plates of meat. Telemachus was sitting with them feeling dejected. Um... This really gives us an insight into Telemachus's frame of mind, his, his identity, um, his imagination. Homer writes of Telemachus sitting there in his seat, putting up with this, that, quote, in his mind, he saw his father coming from somewhere, scattering the suitors and gaining back his honor and the control of all his property. So Telemachus is not doing anything, but he is sitting there imagining his heroic father busting through the door to take care of this problem. In fact, when the disguised Athena arrives as a guest at Odysseus's gates, um, if you remember, we, we went through this earlier, Telemachus actually has to seat the stranger, uh, Athena, who he believes is a stranger, um, far away from the suitors so that the, quote, suitors shouting would not upset the stranger during dinner. He then says to the stranger, quote, these men are only interested in music, a life of ease. They make no contribution. This food belongs to someone else, a man whose white bones may be lying in the rain or sunk beneath the waves. Oh, he must have died. We have no hope. The stranger uh, then says to Telemachus, quote, Who are these banqueters? And what is the occasion? A drinking party or a wedding feast? They look so arrogant and self-indulgent, making themselves at home. A wise observer would surely disapprove of how they act. Telemachus, uh, in this moment, and I think this is uh, really telling of Telemachus's character, Telemachus responds, quote, moodily. 
He says, quote, since you have raised the subject, there was once a time when this house here was doing well. Our future is bright when he was still at home. But now the gods have changed their plans and cursed us and cast my father into utter darkness. He left nothing but tears for me. I do not weep only for him. The gods have given me so many other troubles. All the chiefs and local lords from rocky Ithaca are courting mother, wasting our whole house. She cannot turn these awful suitors down, nor can she end the courting. They keep eating and spoiling my house, and soon they will kill me. Now, Athena, who is still disguised as Mentes, responds outraged. She says, quote, This is monstrous. You need Odysseus to come back home and lay his hands on all these shameful suitors. If only he would come here now and stand right at the gates with two spears in his hands and a shield and helmet, as when I first saw him. So, this is the situation on Ithaca. The scene is set. The king, the patriarch, the father is missing. Telemachus, his son, is angsty and frustrated, rendered impotent and desperate by the usurpation of his house and family. Ithaca itself has become a disordered state, not only because its king, who holds both a practical and a symbolic power, is absent, but also because all of the men Odysseus takes with him to Troy, likely the most competent, courageous, talented men in this small kingdom of Ithaca, they're absent as well. These men are absent from their families, these men that Odysseus took with him. They are absent from their responsibilities and civic duties. They are absent from their sons and daughters' lives. Remember, Odysseus and his men at the start of this story have been gone for nearly 20 years. That means that on this island, many of the young men who are now coming of age, um, or who are fully grown adults, they've been raised without a father at home. Now, the exact number of men that Odysseus would have taken with him um, 20 years ago to fight in the Trojan War, uh, given what Homer tells us, isn't really known with any precision. But just to give you a sense uh, of the impact uh, a loss like this would have, um, one classics scholar estimates that the number must be somewhere between 600 and 1,400 men, given that we know from both the Iliad and the Odyssey that Odysseus sailed out to Troy with 12 ships. The point of debate then, the exact type of ship that would have been used and how many men each of them would have carried, given the task at hand, is still an open question. Historical research suggests that each ship would have carried somewhere between 50 and 120 men. I actually checked this number with Spencer Clavin, the Oxford classicist we had on in episode two, and he said the same thing. He said, he said it's probably somewhere between 600 and 1,440 men. Um, he did the math too. Um, so we do um, have a big range here, but regardless, whether Odysseus took 600 or 1,400, this is a huge number of men for a community to lose to duty and to war. In fact, many of the suitors who are actively plaguing Telemachus' household are actually the sons of absent fathers, the absent fathers that went with Odysseus to war. So the disorder in Ithacan society really gives readers a picture of what happens to a society when all the fathers are gone. As Elizabeth Vandiver says in one of her lectures, the character of Telemachus on the one hand, the character of the suitors on the other hand, are an almost frighteningly realistic portrait of what can happen to young men who grow up with no fathers. Vandiver goes on, quote, Telemachus is immature and unable to assert himself until Athena encourages him. He has been, to use a term I normally don't much like, a mama's boy. The suitors, on the other hand, are completely out of control, completely disregarding all the mores of their society, completely reckless. Those seem to be, and this is still a quote by Vandiver, these seem to be really the two extremes of what does happen, what would happen in a society where all of the fathers were missing and where all of the sons grew up without any fathers to guide them and to teach them how to behave. The dominant theme, then, in the first few books of the Odyssey seems to center around the importance of fathers at the level of the family, the community, the society at large, and even the culture. Telemachus, in many ways, gives us a lens through which to examine this problem of what happens when daddy is absent. And the question, I think, 
is highly relevant to our own society and to our times. In America, this, this issue, the breakdown of the family, the rate of divorce, the absence of fathers, this is something that we can no longer afford to ignore. It's leading to an expansion of the welfare state. And it is, in a wealthy country like America, the great driver of poverty and moral decadence in our society. Single motherhood, and I, again, I'm not railing on single mothers. I was raised for a decent portion of my life by a wonderful, hardworking single mother. But that doesn't change the fact that single motherhood is the single greatest predictor of intergenerational poverty that we have. Look at the statistics. Children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and to commit crime. They are nine times more likely to drop out of school and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. Even when you control for various levels of household income, kids in homes that are absent of a father are more likely to end up in jail, always. And kids who never had a father in the house are the group most likely to end up behind bars. This should be a bipartisan concern. But like climate change for the right, the left refuses to see this as a growing problem, and it is a growing problem. In 1960, 5% of America's children entered the world without a mother and father married to each other. By 1980, it was 18%. By the year 2000, it had hit 33%. And now in 2017, just 17 years later, we are over 42%. And the issue disproportionately affects different racial groups in clearly negative ways as well. If we care about the plight of minority families in this country, we should not look away from this problem. That young men of color in this country, kids who are filled with promise and talent and potential, are growing up without fathers. And you have an education system and a political class and a welfare state that encourages this stuff. So looking back at the chaos and the disorder uh, on the island of Ithaca, um, you really do see that for the reader, the Odyssey becomes a kind of lesson on the importance of fathers to a society, to a culture, and to our young men. As a story, the Odyssey seems to be shouting at the top of its lungs so that all of Western culture can hear, Fathers Matter. All right, so now I'd like to transition pretty quickly um, into our segment with our Western Canon correspondent, Gina Santiago. Um, But before I do that, I want to just mention that I'm creating a podcast every month uh, where I am devoting all of my personal time to reading and analyzing and researching these great works of literature. It's a lot of fun, but it isn't easy and it isn't cheap. Uh, We have to maintain the website. We have to advertise to the extent that we can afford to advertise. Uh, We have to update and maintain our equipment. Uh, We have to, there are various um, applications that you have to purchase to download video clips, um, to perform various functions in the service of really getting the podcast out there. So I just want to let you know that if you go to our website, www.westerncanonpodcast.com, there is a link at the top of the page that, that gives the opportunity to donate. If you click this link, it will bring you to our Patreon account, um, and you can you can give a monthly donation. Each donation comes with a different uh, prize, a different uh, prize that you get for donating, um, and any amount is is truly appreciated. Um, we have some people donating already, um, and it's really helping us out. It's really helping us uh, get the word out there about the show. The more the word gets out, the more people who listen to the show, the uh, more money that comes in, the more we'll be able to do uh, for you as listeners, and the more frequently we'll be able to actually air these episodes. As I've said in some of my previous episodes, I am a full-time uh, high school English teacher, so this is my hobby. I am doing this in my spare time, and again, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Uh, but your donations are greatly appreciated. So go to www.westerncanonpodcast.com and click donate. That would help us out a lot, both me and uh, Gina Santiago, as she helps a great deal with this show. 
That said, I now want to introduce our Western Canon correspondent, Gina Santiago. She is coming on the show today to talk about Odysseus's wily intelligence, and she wants to introduce this concept of phronesis. Here she is. Hi, Gina. Welcome back to the show. Hi, Jordan. How are you? Fantastic. So are you ready to talk about the Odyssey? Yes, I am. I'm psyched uh, <laughs> for this because I've been reading it, uh, rereading it, mulling over it. So I'm ready. I'm finally ready to talk about the Odyssey. Excellent. And you know, for me, one of the, the great challenges is understand, I was mentioning this to Daniel Mendelssohn uh, last month, one of the great challenges for me is understanding Odysseus as a character. He is he is famously hard to pin down. So one of the defining characteristics of our hero, Odysseus, is his famous intelligence, his his wily cleverness. So in the proem, Odysseus is called Polutropos. This is something I talk about at length with uh, Dr. Wilson uh, in this episode, because Odysseus is a man of many twists and turns. He's cunning. He's calculating. We can see this in his many adventures. He's able to strategize. He's able to solve problems and get out of difficult situations. His mind is agile, right? Um, And because of this, uh, he's also many skilled. He can fight. He can think. He can be diplomatic. um, and, And he's also a very good speaker and storyteller. So it's no surprise that Odysseus is famous for his labyrinthine intelligence uh so so tell me do you agree with with sort of his reputation the re- the reputation odysseus has gotten over the years is he indeed the intelligent man of many turns give us your take on odysseus's character i will say yes he is most certainly intelligent he's a very versatile versatilely skilled character highly intelligent um But we have to, oh, at least I'm interested in talking about, well, what kind of intelligence does he exhibit? Uh, So as I was reading the Odyssey, or rereading it, because I read it so many years ago and had the opportunity to read Mm -hmm. it again, um, I I couldn't help but contrast the way that the main characters in the Odyssey are rendered or portrayed, you know, and with, and compare that to the way that characters are rendered or portrayed in the Iliad. Now, I mean, we could probably spend hours and hours talking about some differences between the two works. Um, but because, in my, from my perspective, the character portraits are so rich in the Odyssey, I couldn't help but notice the way that the main hero is talked about, uh, Odysseus. And one thing that kept popping up in my mind is, well, there are repeated references to his resourcefulness and his skill and intelligence. And eventually, I that brought me to thinking about phronesis, like the Greek concept of phronesis, which very broad, if we were to give a very rough or broad or typical translation, yes, please. Like, prudence, like prudence or practical intelligence or practical wisdom. Uh, so for my segment, I, I focused on manifestations of Odysseus' practical intelligence. But um, Specifically, I wanted to talk about phronesis with respect to the other virtues or capacities that he is described as having, you know, specifically the martial virtues that he is known for. Like, he's an exceptional warrior. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's clever. Uh, he's a storyteller, as you mentioned. Like, he's, he's such a versatile character. That's right. So now when you say practical intelligence, what do you mean by practical intelligence? Um, is In my mind, the first thing that pops up is, well, this is a person who is competent, who can, who can make decisions on the fly, who, um, as you said, is versatile and who can excel across uh, a variety of, of tasks and who can solve a variety of problems um, on the spot. So practical intelligence to me, and I'm probably wrong about this, would be something like knowing what to do. Um, uh, what, what is, correct my interpretation, what, is, what am I missing? Actually, your, your definition is straightforward and it's actually not incorrect at all. Um, so just based on putting, you know, just putting together my segment, I was trying to look for... Um, secondary literature that t- specifically address or talk about or pick out Odysseus, Practical Intelligence or Phronesis. And there's one book that's de- entirely devoted to this very topic. It's <laughs> called Odysseus, Hero of Practical Intelligence, subtitled Deliberation and Science in Homer's Odyssey. It's by Jeffrey Barnow. 
uh, B A R N O U W, and it was published in 2004. It's a thick book, and his thesis is actually very sophisticated. However, uh, just to bring it back to your question, the way that Barnell talks about the hero's practical intelligence, he suggests that it's actually epitomized by Odysseus' capacity or capability of being able to anticipate consequences um, and deliberate on action and actually bring about the desired results. Uh, so given Barnell's definition, like what you, your own definition, uh, your own understanding of it is overlaps nicely with that. Um, the other thing is that phronesis is a prominent concept in Aristotelian virtue ethics. Like in right. book six of Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle, Aristotle talks about practical intelligence. And very broadly speaking, um, he also seems to identifying it as identifying define it as the ability to, to deliberate on, you know, the right action at a given moment mm-hmm. and bring about the desired outcomes. So if we were to ascribe phronesis to Odysseus, um, it would be something, broadly speaking, something like having the capacity to pick out the right actions and bring out desired results or outcomes successfully. It's not just about anticipating consequences, but also deciding on the right course of action and actually attaining the desired result being able to carry out the action that you've deliberated upon that's very that's very good that makes sense and and is that barno's thesis is that what he what what is his thesis at the end of the day this guy probably spent years studying this minute issue in in the odyssey so well actually uh barno's thesis uh his book is actually about reconstructing uh, the Homer- Homeric psychology. Mm. Uh, so he, so he, huge portions of the book are devoted to talking about previous works that had attempted to reconstruct or paint the Homeric mind or give some kind of illustration to the Homeric mind. So, like, he talks about Bruno Schnell's book and he talks about Christopher Gale's book, and I made reference to both of those in um, in our Iliad episode. So his, his work is more about sort of reconstructing the Greek mind, and he uses uh, Odysseus, or specifically, because there's a lot of internal action happening. Uh, like, you see the inner right. workings of Odysseus. There are plenty of examples of the inner workings of Odysseus, and he uses those specific examples to talk about what he thinks hap- actually is the Homer- Homeric psychology. Like in terms of like different impulses competing with each other or how the different impulses within the human person work together or against each other. So that's that's really where he's going with the book. Um, and he just happens to use or inner deliberation as part of practical intelligence to sort of as a springboard for his discussion. So I, I imagine then you would have to t- also talk about um, the values that are promulgated in Homeric Greece, you would have to talk about the sort of values and virtues that uh, we talked about, you know, uh, Kleos and Time and things like that. And and what, how, how does that shape the psyche? That would be, that would be interesting to, to, to understand. I suppose you can't ignore it, at least if you're studying uh, Homeric psychology. Right, right. Um, and he does talk about the, the broader cultural context in which the Odyssey is written. Mm. Um, and the other interesting thing that he does, he actually suggests, is that the um, Homeric psychology anticipates some degree, like the Stoic model of psychology, mm. specifically Chrysippus. It's very interesting. I, I, I um, it's basically the only sort secondary piece of secondary literature I was able to find that actually addresses this topic in a very substantive manner. So, so let me ask you then, I think I, I'm personally wondering, how would I distinguish this concept that you've brought up, phronesis, from other forms of intelligence? Uh, I think intelligence right now is kind of a hip topic. We talk about multiple intelligences and IQ and all these uh, sorts of different things. Um, how is phronesis distinguished from other forms of intelligence that uh, you know people like Aristotle talked about, like techne or episteme? Right. Uh, and you went right to the source that I was actually going to talk about. All right, so uh, phronesis is, uh, according to Aristotle, it's basically a combination of rational thinking combined with a type of knowledge. Mm. So 
based on just re- trying to retrieve my own readings and study of uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics in my own memory, uh, it could just be different types of knowledge. So basically, it goes back to the way that we were defining it, or the way that you were defining it at the beginning of the episode, is like knowing what to do and knowing how to apply a certain type of knowledge in, in an actual, like a concrete mm. way. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I guess another way of describing phronesis would be uh, concrete wisdom, or wisdom that can only be shown, demonstrated, or effective practically, nice. right? Yep. Specifically, when you're deciding on a course of action and trying to bring about a certain set of desired outcomes. Right, right. And Aristotle himself argues that phronesis is different from um, Sophia, which he broadly, um, I guess which you could broadly translate as theoretical wisdom. Mm. Yeah, I'd have an opportunity to actually go back to and reread book six of Nicomachean Ethics, but that's where he talks about it. And he, it's so the bottom line, or in some, it's phronesis is a distinct type of intelligence. Gotcha, gotcha. So techne would be something like technical mastery through repeated practice or something like that, and that's just getting better at a skill or something like that. So just as you were saying, techne generally refers to craftsmanship, and mm. this can mean different things depending on who you're talking about. Uh, so you're, you're definitely onto something, at least you're in the you basically picked out the central feature of techne. So, so, phrone- so phronesis is, seems to be practical knowledge, the ability to implement uh, knowledge to succeed in a variety of tasks and, and, um, and that sort of thing. What does phronesis have to do with virtue, though? I was, um, I was looking at some discussion of Plato's Mino, and, you know, phronesis is, is described as a form of moral understanding. Um, it's not really clear what is meant by that. Um, for Aristotle, it means something else. It has to do with virtue. Um, what, what does phronesis have to do with virtue? Is uh, Odysseus a virtuous moral person or uh, are you with Daniel Mendelssohn who seems to feel that Odysseus is actually kind of a shifty character uh, who is actually very uh, morally conflicted and complex uh, in a way that we have to actually question his motives sometimes that is a loaded question as you can imagine that's an ongoing debate among scholars of ancient Greek virtue ethics, specifically scholars in the ethics of, on the ethics of Aristotle and Plato. Um, so there's a reason why I didn't boldly state that, uh, at least my thesis is not that Odysseus uh, embodies uh, pra- phronesis or practical virtue, sorry, practical intelligence, if we were to talk about it, or categorize it virtue. Um, I guess that's something I'm trying to puzzle out. Um, He's certainly resourceful, intelligent. He certainly knows how to navigate his way in all these different, these myriad situations. Um, so I'm tempted to say that he does, you know, it, I mean, I, I guess another way of putting it would be, you know, whether or not, sh- or should we even talk about phronesis in the context, specifically in the context of the Odyssey as a virtue. All right, because if we're going to call it a virtue, then we're su- adding or coloring it with a, moral dimension or moral right. view and it's a little and I'm hesitant to go ahead and say that in the way that um, Odysseus exercises or executes practical intelligence <laughs> that it's in a very virtuous way am, am I making sense? You are making sense and I'm, I'm thinking back to to his year long holiday with Circe <laughs> and you know uh it, we describe Odysseus as this highly competent, uh, you know, this sort of facile, advanced uh, thinker who can get out of any situation, and yet he spends ten years or seven years, I'm sorry, with Calypso, and we get the sense that that he's not, not that he could escape, but if anyone could escape, it would be Odysseus, and here he is, you know, sleeping with this this uh, goddess for seven years. Uh, and even after he, she has made the decision to let him go, um, you know, at the prompting of the gods, it, he has to sleep with her one more time, you know, and uh, Daniel Mendelssohn mentions that he's looking for poisoned arrows, and so, okay, <laughs> it's like... Yeah, I mean, I, 
uh, just go back to the question. I do not want to want to go in a direction of Mendelssohn's thesis that you know we cannot basically we shouldn't put virtue and Odysseus in the same sentence. Um, at least the way he's being rendered in the Odyssey, and I am not inclined to go in the other direction either in saying that you know he's the epitome of phonesis in the Odyssey. Um, but it really comes. Now that the more that I think about this, it really comes down to how you want to define Bernices. But going back to Barno, uh, Barno seems to think that uh, Odysseus is the epitome of practical intelligence and the Odyssey. Um, and he does go into like the moral aspects of it as well in his book. Uh, but again, um, in trying to formulate my own answer, I'm not entirely sure if I would go ahead and say like you know. This, we can therefore say that Odysseus is virtuous or something like that. Because mm. uh, then you also have to have a theory about virtues and how right. the virtues relate to each right. other. And you know, like it just brings you, it's, it's a rabbit hole and it certainly takes you in different directions in terms of philosophical discussion. Well, you're being very diplomatic, uh, and that's very <laughs> Odyssean. I was personally, and, and, and you don't have to have the gall to say this, because, because you're a classicist, and, and you're a scholar, and you have to be careful, and people will hold you to what you say. I was personally wondering, as I was reading this book, and maybe this is something that you've thought about, um, I was wondering, and, I'll, and in a moment I'll ask you, you know, w sort of some of the moments in the Odyssey that, that you think Odysseus is really exercising his intelligence, but I, w I found myself wondering, what is, the, what is the proper telos of a hero? What is the telos of a hero? And I thought, you know, to some degree, um, one's telos as a hero isn't always going to be... Um, that you have to be the most moral person in the world. Sometimes it, it might mean that you have to be the shiftiest uh, person. Sometimes it means that you have to be the craftiest and the most cunning. And and so so maybe it is maybe it does have something to do with 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 virtue. That if you're going to be effective as a hero and you're going to accomplish your telos as a hero, maybe you have to be cunning to fulfill your telos or something like that. Right, but it's interesting because then where we could go with this is saying that it's obviously very culturally culturally and context dependent. Um, sure. Right, so if insofar as Odysseus, for example, is holds to or subscribes to the heroic code in his own way, you know, he can be seen as a very a virtuous, um, a virtuous character. Um, and it doesn't matter if he employs these different tricks and different um, ploys to sort of get himself out of these crazy situations that he finds himself in. Uh, right. So that in itself is an interesting question. That's a consequentialist and, look at, at, at things. Right. It's a sort of right. utilitarian uh, right. hero. Right. Um, right. Right. Considering actions independently or evaluating actions in terms of their consequences. The other thing I... I <laughs> wanted to mention, which actually um, has to do with one of the reasons why I decided to look at this topic is the fact that we're, we've read two war epic poems, uh, both of them having to do with war and having to do with he the heroic code of ancient Greece, like Homeric Greece. Mm -hmm. And I just found it remarkable that um, in the Odyssey that you have all these, like, numerous descriptions of someone's intelligence and cunning um, alongside some of their own martial virtues and accomplishments. I think it's, it's a very interesting portrait that we get of a hero. Mm. Um, like I think that heroes in any kind of, in any context, whether we're talking about, I don't know, heroes of space operas or something, <laughs> or heroes in other kinds of genres, like we don't always get uh, descriptions of their intelligence or no. some of their other virtues or character. You're I mean, right. That's my impression, anyway. This is just a very. Uh, that's just my general impression. I could be wrong about that. No, Here, I mean, we I... have very <clears throat> clear descriptions and explicit references to Odysseus as a resourceful man, as a mentally agile man, that's right. as a trickster, as someone who um, has all these different skills, um, while at the same time being noted for his war wartime accomplishments. It's, it's 
that's what I find interesting about, uh, again, if you have a very rich portrait of a, of a main character, specifically a hero. I totally agree with you. I'm thinking of things like, well, the Iliad, for example, and, yeah. you know, Beowulf, for example. Your, your, your hero is, is not is not described as cunning and intelligent and complex. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily call um, Achilles, you know, wily and, you know, like, compl- I mean, he's broody. He's yeah. broody and, and he's certainly interesting, but he's a beefcake at the end of the day. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and Beowulf is, is, is the same way. Beowulf is a big, you know, muscly Anglo-Saxon warrior filled with, you know, confidence and courage and valor and all this stuff. But he's, uh, he's not complex in the way that um, Odysseus is, and he is not cunning in that way. Um, yeah, his well, right. excellence is in his, in, his, in his sword. And then when you do have complex, intelligent, articulate, um, interesting and shifty uh, heroes like Macbeth, well, they're not really heroes. I've always thought that Macbeth is is a is a brilliant character. Um, there's nothing like that tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow speech. You know, he is a he's a deep, angsty, almost existentially aware uh, person. But he's he's a monster. Right, I'm right, and also, um, you know, you, you can see uh, that Odysseus doesn't think he has to literally fight his way out of every situation. That's right. Um, like, he takes the time to think through things mm. and ponder, like, different courses of action available to him. Like, for example, in, uh, is it book, I believe it's, sorry, book nine, where he and his buddies or companions are trapped in the cave of Polyphemus. And there's a moment where he's trying to, you know, Polyphemus is sleeping or about to go to sleep or drunk, and he's, and li- explicitly we see... I mean, we've seen an explicit, clear example of Odysseus, like, pondering what courses of action he has available. Absolutely. You know, he's, like, deciding whether or not to, you know, A, should I sneak up to him and stab Polyphemus, or should I, but, you know, doing so would possibly bring about more danger to him and his companions, so, and he ponders the alternative course of action. Um, so this is, and actually Barna South cites this one scene as a very clear example of um, Odysseus' protective intelligence, but also how Odysseus is not an impulsive character, and he's a careful, deliberative thinker. That's right, because think of the pressing nature of um, that of, of that experience. You're you are you and your men are captured. You're stuck in a cave. Um, this is horrible. You're all afraid that you're going to die. Um, and you have this w- rare window of opportunity where the Cyclops falls asleep. I think that I would take, pull my sword out and stab Polyphemus <laughs> to death a hundred times in that moment. He waits. Right. But ultimately, Odysseus decides that's a bad course of action. Like, he traces out the consequences of doing that's that. That's right, because he'll be stuck in the cave. There's no way out you'll just have a dead cyclops rotting in front of you while you're stuck in a cave and you starve to death. Right. Or what if he does that and he doesn't quite execute it properly and then you're having an enraged cyclops and, you know, we can pretty much surmise what will happen if that were the case. <laughs> right. Uh, so, right. So, and what's, what I find very interesting about the scene, and it's the same reason that Barno selects it for his book, is that you know, it's not like Odysseus is relaying his plans to anyone. He's thinking this to himself. Like That's we're right. hearing his thoughts. We're hearing him engaging in this act of deliberation, and Barnow calls it inner deliberation, which is very interesting. So, um, if we were just to go ahead and say that Bernesis or practical intelligence is a, most basic or most fundamentally the ability to um, decide on or mull over the right course of action and follow them through, then I think Odysseus certainly exhibits that. Um, if we're, we're going to introduce moral dimensions or talk about in the context of virtue, uh, that's a little tricky in, in my, from my perspective. Right. Um, and it, but it is interesting. As, as I'm reading this scene with Odysseus and Polyphemus, 
I'm thinking the, the way that he reasons through this plan, uh, this is a complex plan. This reminds me of one of those plans in Ocean's Eleven where they go in to rob one of the casinos. It just, it it is so tricky. It's so careful. It's so unlikely uh, to work. And yet he carries out every single detail of it um, properly. And you mentioned that it, he, he deliberates in an inner sense. He doesn't actually say this to anyone. Well, I actually thought, well, maybe part of that is that his men are not as competent as he is. His men are actually, they show themselves to be quite incompetent in, in many ways on the island of Circe when they rush in and, and basically allow her to poison them uh, at the feast table when they eat the cattle of the sun god Helios. Right. Uh, and the other uh, scene that I very briefly wanted to allude to is uh, towards the end, like book 26, I believe, is where we see the... Um, we see Odysseus being reunited with Telemachus, or when Odysseus, specifically when Odysseus reveals himself to Telemachus, and Telemachus brings up this reputation that Odysseus is said to have had, and what we've been talking about, um, the reputation that we've been talking about during the segment. And he says, I've heard of your great fame and how you were fighting man with your mm-hmm. hands. And he also doesn't, he also says, like, I've also heard that you are prudent in counsel. So it's just interesting that you know that Odysseus has not only do we see you know Odysseus um being being an example of practical intelligence but also he's a you know skilled warrior skilled fighter but that he has this reputation and it's not and it's well known like he's known for having these very versatile traits that we've been discussing so you've mentioned two instances that clearly demonstrate uh, Odysseus' intelligence you mentioned his reputation, right? Well, uh, one, yeah, right. So one instance in which he de- he demonst- he exhibits his intelligence, and in one instance in which uh, we, we see, see how others view him, right? Refer to those same characteristics or view him, right? Or speak to those re- to his reputation, right? And he he also demonstrates, in my opinion, as a storyteller, as a podcaster, as uh, someone who likes a good lecture, one of the facets of his intelligence that. Uh, gives me the most admiration for him is his ability to tell long entertaining rambling tales and to entertain people for hours days on end the idea that he can ingratiate himself instantly uh, when he arrives on the shores of scoria he meets this young girl who ought to actually be quite afraid of him he is able to uh beguile her um, by giving her compliments and then and then walking it back and then and then and then pushing forward and then asking it for her help in this incredibly uh, eloquent, charming way, and then to be able to ingratiate himself with uh, Alcinous and Arete and basically keep them up all night telling stories, stories that would sound ridiculous uh, to, to any to any uh, well-adjusted <laughs> Greek. Uh, is is amazing to me and i actually want to read a quote and maybe i'll get your thoughts on this this quote is when he is he is flattering uh, nausicaa he, he arrives on the shores of scoria she is out doing the laundry with her maidens um and and he's telling her that she has the beauty and the stature of artemis and that she fills him with awe uh he says uh he says this quote the hard sorrow is on me yesterday on the 20th day i escaped the wine blue sea until then, the current and the tearing winds had swept me along from the island Ogygia, and my fate has landed me here. Then have pity, O oh queen. You are the first I have come to after much suffering. There's no one else that I know of here among the people who hold this land and this city. Uh, show me the way to town and give me some rag to wrap me in. And then may the gods give you everything your heart longs for. May they grant you a husband and a house and sweet agreement in all things. For nothing is better than this, more steadfast, than when two people, a man and his wife, keep a harmonious household, a thing that brings much distress to the people who hate them, and pleasure to their well-wishers, and for them the best reputation. And and to me, this, this, this quote is incredible because he is like, he's, this is an incredible pitch. He is like an, an ad man. He's not only trying to convince her to help him out hey lady um i need help uh you know help a brother out uh what he's doing is that he's putting in her mind a picture of what her future could look like 
if she helps him. This is like amazing psychology. The, these manipulative tactics. He he paints a picture of 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 her future happiness after she's helped him out, which is incredible. I would I would never think of this. And she basically tells right. him, I mean, he, "You're you're wow, you're so brave and thoughtful and well spoken and clever. <laughs> like I, I I guess I have to help you." Right. It's interesting because I think uh, like we've been talking about his practical intelligence and more like um, sort of more narrow terms of you know being able to think about what courses of action you should take i think that very scene illustrates another dimension of his practical intelligence and that is uh i guess his that manifestation and that that scene it's basically him being using his social tact or his acumen right, right. um his social acumen and social tact in that situation to help further his own goals and we, I guess we could argue that's another function, another dimension of his practical intelligence, right? Like his practical intelligence is not just, you know, relegated to him figuring out, well, how the hell am I going to get out of this cave or, I don't know, escape this cyclops who right. wants to eat me and my yeah. bones for yeah, dinner. Yeah, yeah. In this case, we have a different situation, but he's trying to get himself out of another situation, or, um, but he doesn't have to... You, um, employ his practical intelligence in exactly the same way but in this case it's social tact and social acumen um as an example is another dimension of his practical intelligence right that and makes it, sense? yeah it does and and i would say it's yeah, that yeah. combined with i mean more than even more than that more than social yeah. tact in order to be that uh psychologically acute you have to also be self-aware what works on people how do people right. think? How do I think? How am I coming off? You have to be incredibly self-aware. And so I think there are many moments uh, in the Odyssey that Odysseus shows himself to actually be uh, very self-conscious in, in a good way, um, in, a, in, a, in a humanistic way almost. Um, and to have that psychological foresight, to have that knowledge of, of the psyche, um, to me was impressive and then and then of course it works he both flatters her and and he also comes across as uh, an articulate person in need of in need of her help and then she leads him to her beautiful magical kingdom and then he entertains every he's a, he's also a magisterial uh, storyteller it it takes it also takes a lot of psychological depth and um a kind of verbal intelligence as well to be able to tell a good story with suspense and tension and high drama and um, pathos and he's able to do that and and they beg him to keep going they are utterly captivated and beguiled and this to me is one of the things that's really special about Odysseus that I think is absent um, in a lot of these you know gruff uh, heroes that you see in western literature right and the other thing I want to mention which doesn't really have anything to do with practical intelligence but i mean so far like if, if, if someone were listening to this segment or listening to the show of uh, both episodes and they haven't read the odyssey i i wonder if they would get the impression that odysseus is like maybe a sociopath or psychopath or something <laughs> um but you know a psychopath who doesn't have any emotional debt but he also has a lot of emotional debt there are definitely scenes where we see him you know you know he obviously wants to go back home he's yearning to go return home there are various moments when he cries because he's stranded right like when he's right. uh, basically uh calypso's sex slave like he is crying because he can't he's not been able to leave and go home right so not only is he uh resourceful fiercely intelligent charming charismatic and has social acumen um and and apparently a, a good grasp of human nature and psychology he also has a lot of emotional debt to him and this is not the first time we see this when we go back to the iliad we see examples of you know these heroes having these poignant emotional moments um even in the iliad again odysseus is a very interesting well-rounded character um which is something you would not really expect in an epic poem. Right, and I think there is, there, there's actually a moment uh, early, early on on the island of Ogygia that he demonstrates um, exactly what you're talking about, the idea that, that he's, he's not a sociopath at all, and I certainly don't mean to uh, 
paint him that way. Um, no, there's, no. there's there's a moment when w- we get to really see who this guy is. I think, you know, he 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 is miserable. He's been crying. He's been held back from his wife and his family. And the interesting thing here is that he's offered immortality uh, by Calypso. He's offered right. immortality. You get to be, you get to live forever with me here on this island. Your life's going to be perfect. You're going to be essentially a god um, if you stay with me. Uh, and and he chooses mortality. He chooses mortality. He chooses uh, a mortal life with his middle-aged wife, right? Instead of staying, uh, staying on this island of Ojigia with this with this goddess. Um, I I just have a hard time believing uh, that um, that many that a sociopath would do this. <laughs> um, right. But but also his psychological depth is on display as he as he communicates with Calypso. He doesn't say um, to Calypso, "I love my wife more than you. I think my wife is more beautiful than you. Therefore, I have to go." He doesn't. He doesn't do that because that would offend her, and and that wouldn't lead to a good result. He says this to her. He says, "I have to go home." He he even admits to her, "My wife can never match your beauty. You're a goddess." Okay, um, let's let's be real here. But I have to go home. That's where I belong. And I think that's that's brilliant. Both both in terms of his foresight, anticipating what her reaction is going to be. Uh, I think it's a beautiful sentiment about how much he values his family, and um, I think you really get to see who he is in, in that moment. Right. I mean, he's certainly not a brusque, opportunistic character, despite you know all the examples we have of his somewhat questionable uh, employment of his intelligence in various scenes. Uh, but right, he's a he's a very he's emotionally rich, he's psychologically rich, and self aware, um, and also. Another thing that we can ascribe to him is loyalty. Like he's certainly loyal he to is. his family and yep. his wife. Like, you know, it's it's very interesting. So going back to a question that we keep um, bringing up, you know, well, can we, if we're going to go ahead and say that Odysseus is the epitome of practical intelligence in the Homeric world or the Homeric poems, can we ascribe a moral dimension to it? And that scene might possibly give us some sort of the evidence that we need to go ahead and say, no, like ultimately his practical intelligence has a moral dimension. And therefore we can go ahead and say that he's virtuous. Uh, so it's, it's interesting um, just examining these scenes individually and seeing what we can glean from them about Odysseus' character. Um, so overall, I would say that he's a good guy and, you know, it, he's not just a trickster and um, he's a loyal war hero and I think that's you know it's it's a it's a very interesting portrait that we get in this kind of literature I like I like the way you put that and it reminds me of a talk that Jordan Peterson gave about um, about it was it was uh, almost tacky dating advice for men um, but what he said was that women, uh, and this may be a broad generalization, but I but I really liked what he said that women um, women don't want a harmless man, and I I connected that I was listening to this around the same time that I was reading the Odyssey, and I was thinking about Odysseus. Um, Odysseus is a potent man. He is not a harmless man. Um, he has a beast within him, and so Jordan Peterson's point is that women want to be with a beast who treats them well. A beast who reigns it in and has control over their more potent, more dangerous side. So women want a a dangerous man who doesn't behave dangerously towards them, or doesn't, or who can who can. And so he he brings up the story of Beauty and the Beast and um, a, and things like this. Uh, but this is how Odysseus. That that might be a crude explanation, but this is how Odysseus strikes me. Odysseus strikes me as someone who is dangerous who has a cunning intelligence who is capable who can fight um who knows more than he than he lets out in any given situation but he can also rein it in and be a loving husband um and father yeah that's a very interesting connection and actually barno gets into that um, really that's 
Yeah, yeah. He basically he doesn't put it in quite the same terms, but he that's basically what he's talking about. Right. So um, Barno wants to give us a different picture of Homeric psychology. And so he talks about the different impulses that exist within the human soul and how we reconcile one with the other and whether or not there's a hierarchy of these different parts of the soul. Like, you know, I mean, you know, obviously in, in Plato's tripartite psychology, there's a hierarchy within right. the parts of the soul. Right. And he explores, Barnow explores whether or not we have a hierarchy of the different parts of the soul in, um, in Homeric psychology. Can you remind uh, listeners what that things, tripart division is? Uh, I know, but I but it would, might be good for our listeners to maybe give us the analogy of the the, the chariot or something like that. Okay, so just very quickly in uh, Plato's Republic, uh, Plato or specifically Socrates gives us a very elaborate analogy. Sorry, presents us a sort of a picture of the human soul, and he believes or argues that the human soul basically consists of three component parts. They're not necessarily competing with one another. Um, if anything, you know, the soul of an, a virtuous philosopher king is orderly in a way that you know all three function in harmony. So the most dominant part of the soul, or what should be the dominant part of the soul, is the intellect, and that corresponds to the virtue of wisdom. And the sort of next tier part of the soul is this. I forgot what he calls it. It's the seat of courage. Mm. Um, it's sort of this part of the soul that it impels you to act or that motivates you to act. Spirit, right? Spirit's the, the second of, one? Yes, yeah, 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 spirit, spirit. Right, there you go. That's what I was looking for. Uh, that's the second part of the soul. And the third part of the soul, which is supposed to be subordinate to the other two that I briefly mentioned, is the sort of desirous, appetitive part mm. of the soul. Mm -hmm. And... Like, if you're a properly ordered, virtuous person, um, the intellect rules over the spirited part and the desirous part of right, the soul. But you right. need all three in order to be able to function properly as a human being. Um, so, I mean, you might see instances of different impulses competing with each other in Homeric psychology. But one of the things that Barnow mentions is that um, one function of... Odysseus' practical intelligence is that he's able to rein in his right, impulses right. in the right way, in exactly the way that you were describing. Like he's this, he's not a harmless man at all of anything. He could wreak havoc and he could probably be very dangerous to anyone around him if he really if he wanted to. So he's he well integrated. Control, but he's well integrated. He's well integrated, right? If we were to you know have fun with this <laughs> and try to, I don't know, talk about Platonic tripartite psychology in the context of the Odyssey, we could, it would be very interesting, like the kind of portrait we would paint of Odysseus if we were going to use Plato as a reference. I'm sensing a new um, paper really coming on. He's really good at reining in his, right, he's uh, <laughs> reining in his impulses in the right way. He knows exactly what kind of skills he needs in a situation. Like, you know, the way that he interacts with Polyphemus is very different from the way he interacts with Calypso. Right. Um, so it's very interesting um, code switching like he's yes code switching I guess <laughs> way putting it. yeah well very good that's excellent um let me uh in, unless there's anything else that you want to say about um odysseus as a character um i i think we did a really good job of sort of thinking through uh what it means to say that uh odysseus is intelligent and uh Polutropos and that he has phronesis. Um, let me ask you: uh, Is there a is there a translation of the Odyssey uh, that you prefer or that you think does the best job? I've, I've been trying to ask uh, all of my guests this question because I, I'm just curious and, and I'm getting answers that are all over the map um, right now. <laughs> I am uh, very much attracted to the Robert Fagel's. Uh, version of the odyssey um for this episode i am using emily wilson's brand new translation um her her bold translation of of the odyssey um the Lattimore translation i used that for the last episode um what is your preferred uh translation okay i well i use the Lattimore translation to prepare for her our for the for this segment I have the Fagel's translation. I've read it, and I have not read Emily Wilson's 
uh, translation of the Odyssey. I'm looking forward to reading it. But I definitely do like the Lattimore translation. It's it can it sometimes reads awkwardly, but I like it. As someone who has studied classical Greek, I I, I can't shake myself or get wean myself off the preference for translations that try to stay remain as faithful to the Greek as possible. Um, so for, right now my pick would be Lattimore, but I'm very much open to changing my mind once I read other translations, specifically Emily Wilson's translation. What What do you think is the, uh, I, I'm putting you on the spot here, what do you think is, would you say maybe is the most um, important virtue um, for a, what is the, what is the telos of a, of a good, uh, translation of the Odyssey into English. What 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 do you think matters uh, at the like end of the what, day? What, okay, so basically, I think translators should just strive for what might be construed as the impossible, which is trying to remain faithful to the Greek, but at the same time, um, render the text engaging enough to modern readers without sacrificing content. Mm. <laughs> it's I can only imagine that it's really hard to do like any kind of translation, whether it's ancient Greek, French, Latin, German, or whatever. Um, or at least try to strike a balance between delivering the content or presenting the content in a very engaging way that would be that you know, that would be appreciated by a modern audience. By modern audience I'm not I'm talking about just like the reading public in general. Like not just scholars or college students, but anyone who's interested in picking up a translation of the Odyssey and Iliad, reading it. So I can balance between that and staying faithful to the Greek, um, which is, I mean, it's a very difficult task, as I can only imagine, um, because Greek literature, whether we're talking about Plato's dialogues or Homer's poems, or whether we're talking about the Greek tragedies, like it's such a, ancient Greek such a rich language. Um, not just in the Athenian dialect, but also like the Homeric dialect, that the writer's skill, you know, in the original language cannot be completely conveyed. And if you, you know, when you're rendering the same text in English, so mm. you do lose some of the poetry right. and the artistic um, skill when you're translating into English. So right. I, it's a hard task to remain faithful to the structure and the rhythm. Um, and the art of the ancient Greek originals, and at the same time deliver present the content to a modern audience right. in a different language. Right. Um, like, I don't know anything about translation theory, uh, but it, I, it's it's hard to say. Like I'm not quite sure where I stand on it. Um, it's I tend to default to translations that remain as faithful to the Greek as it is pos- as it is possible. I actually, I, I don't know very much about translation theory either, although I asked uh, Emily Wilson, um, Dr. Wilson, about it uh, in, in some depth. Um, and at what I was trying to get across to her, and I, and I still feel this way about what I want in a translation as someone who, who can't read the ancient uh, the Greek, Homeric Greek, um, it, there are different things that I want in a translation. So on the one hand, there is this Stanley Lombardo translation. Um, his proem starts with, speak memory of the cunning hero. And the text sort of goes along like that. It's very accessible, uh, as, as you said, but almost too accessible. It, it is so simple. You know, it reads like, you know, a, a, a kid's illustrated version or something like that. Um, and right. and then there's Robert Fagels, who uh, Dr. Wilson said, well, yes, it's a beautiful text, but he does take some liber- liberties. For me, if I want a pleasurable experience, if I want to feel like I'm reading, you know, uh, Wordsworth <laughs> translating uh, uh, Homer, that's what Fagels gives to me. And then, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Wilson actually said, I, I had asked her, well, what if I want the the qualia of experiencing the Odyssey in a way that I would have experienced it had I lived in ancient Greece, actually uh, attending a sung performance of it? And she said, well, that's impossible to, to know, really, but, but um, maybe uh, the, you want to look at the George Chapman translation. Uh, uh, translation, she said, the 17th century. Oh, interesting. Chapman uh, translation. Yeah. That that that, uh, right. that the one I that mean, Keats I, loved. Right. <laughs> I 
like when it comes to translations of Plato, I prefer Hackett's uh, Hackett Publishing's translations. I think mm. they're very clear and clean and direct. And for Homer, I am partial to Lattimore's translations of both the Iliad and Odyssey. But I, when I have the time, I would love to read Emily Wilson's translations as well as some of the other translations that are available out there. I have not read Lombardo's uh, translation of the Odyssey. Um, that's also by Hackett, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is by Hackett. Yeah, okay, yeah. No, I haven't read that one. I remember re- reading reviews of it, and that's actually one of the complaints, uh, a common complaint among some of the reviewers, that it's, like, way too simple. <laughs> and maybe that's why, that's, that might have been what deterred me from reading it, but I'm willing to give it a chance. But, There's something uh, for everyone, isn't there? There is, there is, there is. <laughs> um, okay, so it was great talking to you. Um I wish you luck on your job search and your dissertation. And um, next month will be Aeschylus. Are you ready? Yes, I am. I'm (laughs) super excited to talk about Aeschylus for next month. Fantastic. All right. Thanks for checking in. All right. Thanks for having me. As always, it was a great conversation. Great conversation. Thank you. Great. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. So that was a great conversation as always. And before we go, I'd like to just touch back on our conversation about fathers and the importance of male virtue in the service of maintaining order and stability in a society. You hear these terms kicking around, terms like toxic masculinity and male privilege and smashing the patriarchy, and it occurs to me that as women thankfully continue to thrive in society, for example, as they graduate college at higher rates than men, attend graduate school at higher rates than men, get better grades than men, and as young women, uh, childless women, go on to earn more money than men in many U.S. cities, it occurs to me that men really do get a bad rap, that masculinity in general gets a bad rap. So I want to leave off this episode with a clip from a conversation between the psychologist Jordan Peterson and the feminist philosopher and, frankly, one of my heroes. We also happen to share an alma mater in SUNY Binghamton, Camille Paglia. I'm including this clip in the episode because uh, Camille Paglia actually mentions the Odyssey um, and the scene with uh, Nausicaa, uh, and she and Jordan discuss the importance of both the masculine and the feminine in a balanced civilization. Enjoy the clip. I thought of ideologies as fragmentary mythologies. That's where they get their archetypal and psychological power, right? And so in a balanced representation, you have the terrible mother and the great mother, as, as Neumann laid out so nicely. And you have the terrible father and the great father. So that's the fact that culture mangles you half to death while it's also promoting you and developing you. You have to see that as balanced. And then you have the heroic and adversarial individual. But in the postmodern world, and this seems to be something that's increasingly seeping out into the culture at large, you have nothing but the tyrannical father, nothing but the destructive force of masculine consciousness, and nothing but the benevolent benevolent great mother and it's a it's an appalling ideology and it seems to me that it's sucking the vitality which is, which is exactly what you would expect symbolically it's sucking the vitality of our culture you see that with the increasing demolition of of young men um, and not only young men in terms of their academic performance which like they're falling way behind in elementary school way behind in junior high and bailing out of the universities like mad and so and i i well, the public school education has become completely permeated uh, by this kind of uh, anti-male propaganda. I mean, in, I, to me, public schools are just a form of imprisonment, you know, right now. Mm-hmm. They're particularly destructive to young men who have a lot of physical energy, okay? Uh, yeah, now, you know, I identify as transgender, okay, my, myself, okay, but I do, not, uh, I do not require the entire world to alter itself, okay, to, to fit my particular self-image. I, I do believe in uh, the power of hormones. I believe that men exist and Women exist, and they are biologically different. I think that I think there is no cure for um, the culture's ills right now, except if men start standing up okay, and demanding that they be respected as men again. Okay. Part of what I see happening is that, like, I think that women whose relationship with men have has been seriously pathologized cannot distinguish between male authority and competence and male tyrannical power. Mm-hmm. Like they fail to differentiate because all they see is the oppressive male. Mm-hmm. And, and they may have had experiences that, that um, 
their experiences with men might have been rough enough so that that differentiation never occurred, because it, it has to occur. And you have to have a lot of experience with men, and good men too, before that will occur. And it seems to me to be invading the culture and undermining the, the masculine power of the culture in a way that's, I think, fatal. I really do believe that. I, I, too, I too believe that these are, this is symptomatic of the decline of Western culture, and it, we, and, and it will just go down flat. I don't think people realize that you know, the, the masculinity still exists okay, in the world as a code among jihadists. Okay? And, yes. and when you have passionate masculinity okay, circling the borders like the Huns and the Vandals during the Roman Empire, that, that's what I see. I see this culture rotting from within okay, and, and disemboweling itself, literally. Now, I have an overview of, of why we're having these problems. Right? And it, it comes from the fact that I'm the product of an immigrant family. All four of my grandparents and my mother were born in, in Italy. So I remember from my earliest years in this factory town in upstate New York where the, my, my relatives came to work in the shoe factory, I can remember still okay, the, the life of the agrarian era, okay, which, were not, which was for most of human history, okay, uh, the agrarian era, where there was the world of men and the world of women. And the sexes had very little to do with each other. Each had power and status in its own realm. Right? And, and, they, and they laughed at each other, in, in essence. Mm -hmm, okay? yeah. the, the women had enormous power. In fact, the old women ruled, not the young, beautiful women like today. Okay? But the, the, the older you were, the more you had control over everyone, including the mating and marriage. Um, you, they, there were no doctors, so, the, the, so you had the, you know, the, the old women were like midwives and knew all the ins and outs of this and inherited knowledge about pregnancy and all, all these other things. Right? I can remember this, this and, and the joy that women had with each other. All day long, okay, cooking with each other, you know, companions to each other, talking, conversing. My mother remembered as a small child in Italy, when it was time to do the laundry, they would take the laundry up the mount, up the hill to the fountain, Il Sorgo, okay, and, and do it by hand. They would sing, they would picnic, and so on, all right? And we, we get a glimpse of that in the Odyssey, when Odysseus is, is, is thrown up naked on the shores of Phaeacia, all right? And, and he hears the, the sound of, of, of women, young women laughing and singing, and it's not Zikia, the princess, bringing the women to do the laundry. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. So that's it for this episode. I'd like to thank our guest for the month, Emily Wilson, and also our Western canon correspondent, as always, Gina Santiago. Thank you also to all of you who have listened to this show with fidelity. We really appreciate it. We'll see you next month as we jump into Greek tragedy. Very exciting. Again, thanks for listening and happy reading. Happy reading.